You're all set. Go ahead, Andy. Okay. Uh, with great apologies for the delay in starting the meeting because of a uh, conflicting meeting that ran over, uh, I want to uh, call the uh, meeting of the Finance Committee to order on May 13, 2021. Um, and it is now 1.25 p.m. And uh, so with that, um, this is a meeting that pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Law Chapter 30, Section 18. This meeting of the Finance Committee is being conducted via remote participation. So I need to um, quickly ask each member of the committee uh, to indicate that they can hear me and that we can hear them uh, so that we can confirm that we're in compliance with all of the requirements. Um, so let me start with Bob Hegner. I'm here. <coughs> uh, Lynn Guzmer. Present. Uh, Kathy Shane. I'm here. Kat DeAngelis. Present. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Present. Bernie Kubiak. Present. And Jane Scheffler. I'm here. Okay, great. So we have a uh, full complement of the committee. Um, as noted, uh, this is a busy agenda. We're going to try and um, get through it as best we can. Uh, the uh, Finance director has requested a specific order for consideration. And of course, we always, uh, I, I want to move along to that request. Um, so um, I don't know if you have any introductory comments on recreation you want to make, Sean, or whether. I'll quickly introduce Barb and um, Donna, who are here from the recreation department. Um, I don't believe we received any questions in advance, so I think Barb is just going to give sort of a brief overview of the Recreation Department and, um, and then turn it over for questions. Thank you, Barb. Sure. Uh, thank you, Sean. So just a quick overview of um, sort of the three different areas that have, you know, that we'll be presenting at the budget. Uh, we'll start with the overall recreation budget and talk a little bit about our accomplishments this year. Much of, much of that uh, was dictated by the uh, pandemic. However, we did do our best to follow our strategic plan and were able to accomplish uh, some of the goals that we had set out for the first, or I think all of the goals actually, that we had set out for the first year uh, of that strategic plan. Uh, so I... Uh, Great thanks. thanks to my staff, as well as the commission and community members who helped us achieve that. So that's been very, um, um, very, very successful. And it's an excellent tool to have to guide the department as we move forward. Um, let's see, we have certainly um, increased our, our, our presence on social media. Um, our, um, in, we've created, I think we've been very creative in uh, sort of meeting the needs of the community in terms of virtual as well as in-person recreational programming. So we were able to do that. And um, then helping in other departments, which I, you know, have to uh, give my um, compliments to my staff. They just really stepped up and were instrumental in, in working with various departments to help the community where folks really needed it. So that was great. Uh, we've also worked to also strengthen our relationships with organizations like the BID, the Chamber, the Survival Center, local businesses, and other um, departments within the town. So that has also helped us be successful as we sort of pivoted to different types of special events and other activities that we've done for the town um, over the past year. So the challenges, of course, were mostly related to the pandemic. I've talked a little bit about that. Um, and then, you know, just basically trying to increase our accessibility, both our in a, in a physical accessible way, as well as making sure that our programs are accessible to everyone, regardless of their ability to pay. So that, that has been a challenge, but I believe we, we're working to meet those needs. 
Um, and then expanding, as I talked before, about the uh, different relationships with other organizations in, within the town, um, private as well as public. Uh, let's see. So in terms of status, you know, I think some of the and status to the to a prior year objectives, looks like we accomplished pretty much everything we set out to do. Uh, Groff Park is now, uh, you know, an incredible, um, viable uh enthusiastic place for kids to be it's just fun um fun 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 it's just been great i don't know if you get a chance it's it's we're really coming along it looks like we might be able to open that early this year possibly as early as memorial day so fingers crossed on that um and then i'm sure you've seen the developments happening at uh, kendrick park which is also exciting to see that and there'll be other changes at mill river the basketball courts the dpw has been doing work on those and one contractor will, will be in shortly so from that standpoint from a capital standpoint again lots happening uh let's see da, da, da. and of course we rebranded ourselves we're now the amherst Rec we're amherst recreation or the amherst recreation department if you will as part of the town and no longer leisure services and supplemental education. So that has been a positive mood and one move in one of the community um, that was really on their top in terms of priorities for sort of identifying who we are. And um, it's been a great, a great transition. So now we're on to the year two object objectives that order will be outlined, which are outlined in the strategic plan. So we'll be working on those uh, in this coming year. We are working on them now. So are there any questions? And one thing I'll just add real quick, two things, actually. Um, if anybody finds LSSC anywhere in the budget document, document, let me know, because we scoured that thing high and low, and we still were finding them like the day before. Um, but the other thing I just want to note is um, Barb's department was sort of the hero this year in a lot of ways. Um, I'm sure Paul will talk about it more later. Um, whenever something needed to be done during COVID, when there was sort of a new responsibility that came up, it was often Barb's department that stepped up and, and did it um, and made a lot of things work um, for, for the town this year. So um, Barb's department was very busy, busy during, the, uh, during the pandemic. So I actually do have a bunch of questions to um, ask, uh, but uh, I want to acknowledge that uh, Barb is with us for the her last round as <laughs> uh, the uh, director of the recreation department, and uh, we will sorely miss you. Um, this has been a challenging year, and I really do want to congratulate the department for its great success under extremely challenging circumstances. But we are here today to look at the budget for the year ahead, and so I'm going to be focusing on the on the coming year um, a little bit more than uh, actually all instead of looking at the prior year. And uh, so the, the questions that I have is uh, how you project the, uh, as we're getting hopefully to the end of the COVID crisis, but we're still working through it, how that transition is going to affect the operations of the department and the ability to manage the department along the budget lines that we have um, presented to us. And in particular, um, ability to get part-time staff, which is always an important summer piece, um, ability to reach out to the community and let them know about the programs and get, them, uh, get people to sign up so both for participation and uh, because ultimately uh, we're also work with revolving funds and we need participation to get revenue. So uh, sort of like what you're projecting is the challenges and um, what steps you're taking to get us there for the year ahead. Okay, thanks, Annie. I'll start with um, the challenges related to part-time staff. That that certainly, as we know, I'm sure you've read. Um, you know, it's been a challenge for everyone right now, trying to get, uh, you know, basically minimum wage, entry level um, positions filled this summer. We've been fortunate, though. I must say, um, we started early, and uh, we did did a lot of. 
our out, outreach to UMass, um, to our former employees and so forth that we've had, you know, um, working for us part time with the camps and at the at the pools. And so far, uh, we're a little bit ahead of where we were last year in terms of um, being able to fill those positions. So uh, that's been a positive. So um, fingers crossed that trend continues. Um, as far as, you know, reaching out to the community in terms of getting the word out about our programs, uh, certainly we've had to change um, kind of as kind of roll with the punches, if you will, uh, in terms of the numbers of kids that we can serve, which of course affects the amount of revenue we can we can bring in. But uh, we are, you know, we're just we're checking those numbers, and we may uh, end up moving some of the uh, minimums up so that we can serve more children. Uh, we also don't hire, and we would have to hire more staff. So we're hoping that would be a, you know, that we'll be able to do that. Um, but we're just going to be have to be flexible in our approach to um, providing programs. You know, we're we're sort of at a certain point right now, but maybe a month or two from now, that might be very different. So we're just going to have to uh, evolve and um, pivot and make sure that you know, we're able to serve the needs of the community and the kids that need to be in these programs. Were you referring in, um, largely to the uh, summer camp programs in there? Mostly, yeah, summer camps has been um, the biggest challenge in terms of the limitations they put on the numbers of children who can participate right now. Are there hesitations you're finding from families participating? Are you finding that families are eager to have participation, get those kids out of the house finally? Seems to be the latter. <laughs> Actually, it seems to be like many of our programs we, we have following strict, you know, protocols from DPH. Uh, and a lot of what we're doing is outdoors a lot, probably almost what at Don is with me. She's our operations director, um, but probably about 80 to 90 percent of what we'll be doing will be outdoors this year. Okay, and then I have one more question I'm going to ask Sean or Paul. Um, and uh, then uh, I see Dorothy's hand is up, so I want to get to the other members of the committee then. Uh, but Mike, the, uh, are there any of the programs that we're looking at that we would like to have um, Amherst Recreation do that might also coincide with where there's um, money available from the Recovery Act or other similar sources? Um, that's a good question, Andy. I'm not, I can't think of anything off the top of my head um, related to that. Um, but I'll, you know, we just got more information on, on the new programming um, a couple a day or two ago. Um, and so we're still kind of waiting for different state agencies to kind of articulate what exactly that means for us. Uh, but nothing jumps out to me, at least from the newest grant that would, um, affect FY22 budget, but that's not to say that there isn't something. So um, we'll take that question and, and take another look at it and see if anything comes up. Okay. And, and I, Andy, are you, are you, suggest, are you I, I, just to confirm the question is, is there any programming, recreation programming that might be able to be funded from the um, American Rescue Plan Act? Is that what the question was? Yeah, I mean, there, there's several different elements to it, but, um, you'll know where the revenue gaps are going to um, come from some of the programs that we traditionally run. I think that the hard thing is that for any um, enterprise um, where you, you know, this has just been an unpredictable time and will continue to be an unpredictable time. Yeah, one thing you will see in the, um, in the budget proposal is some proposed funding from the American Rescue Plan for recreation programming, specifically for Cherry Hill. Um, you know, we'll talk about that more as more information comes out, but that's more related to the, the, uh, the loss of revenue eligible use related to that grant, um, which again, we'll get into more detail, but um, we'll look at that and, and we'll let you know if we find anything else. Dorothy, did you have a question? Um, yes, I, I did. It's, it's a statement and a question. Um, 
I'm, I like the change of name. I'm, I'm reminded of something that um, when I was a, an adolescent in the 50s, I met many people who are older who'd majored in the 1920s in games and games and recreation. And it be, I was kind of surprised by that, but it turned out it was a very big major and had been part of a big movement. Um, when perhaps related to the, the flu epidemic, I don't know, with the realization of the importance of play. And um, I have just been feeling finding that out in terms of my own grandchildren this year. And I was wanted to say to you to think big and think bigger. Um, with limitations of space, I, I know how it's challenging, but I think every child in Amherst who wants to play outdoors should be able to do so. And somehow we should find a way to make that possible. Okay. Are there other questions from the committee as we, um, start with as we go uh, re review the different sections of the budget. Kathy? Um, it's, it's uh, Barb may have already summarized some of this, but your overall staffing, if I look back a few years is down when I took it all of recreation. And you said if um, you can open up camps, if there's an ability to do that, revenue comes in. Do you have an ability then to augment staff if there are more revenues, you hire summer interns or you hire supplemental? So just, you know, how you staff it. One of, when Andy was saying, thank you for all you've done, I watched what you did in the last year is short staffing. Barb just appeared over at the golf course, then Barb was over at another place. So she was, she was staffing services. And I think some of it was supplemented by other town staff were helping out or you, you know, we redeployed because they weren't needed. So just, you know, as you, in reopening, do you, is there flexibility if more revenues are coming in to augment, as Dorothy was saying, programs with staff, the staffing of them? Uh, good question, Kathy. Uh, I would say absolutely, because with those those uh, programs, for the most part, come out of the revolving fund, um, the camps, our sports, summer sports programs, and so forth. And the um, so we could we could absolutely um, hire more part time staff to augment those programs. The pools um, it is a little bit different, but we have room in that budget to also hire additional staff if at some point we we are allowed, for instance, to teach lessons swim lessons, but right now we can't. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Rainy, you're muted. I gotta mute myself here. Uh, yeah, Barbara, just um, let me offer my thanks for uh, you making my, uh, my grandkids very happy um, and giving me something to do with them. Um, the question I have is just a simple one. The, the um, the fee subsidy numbers that you presented, are those uh, individuals or are those duplicate counts? Um, let's see, and Donna, maybe you can help me on that, but I believe they're in indiv each individual. Is that correct, Donna? Yes. So <laughs> there's usually, there's a listing um, for families and for individuals. Mm -hmm. Okay, but they, these are on duplicated counts. That's I just right. want to get some notion of how many of the how many kids we're we're helping out here. And again, thanks. <laughs> so, um, do we want to take a moment to go through um, the ver some of the other programs um, and, and just get the touch on each one? and see if there are any financial issues that we need to be concerned about or we're confident that the budget will run through. And I think we've talked a little bit about the summer camp programs. Um, do you, isn't sign up usually farther along at this point in the year, um, in, in a normal year? We generally would start a little bit earlier than this, but uh, 
you know, we got a little bit of a late start. Basically, we were waiting for the um, the regulations from the state. So, you know, although we were planning and <clears throat> starting to develop curriculum and so forth, we really didn't have our guidelines from the state in place until a, a few weeks ago. But uh, yeah, it's we're a little bit late, but not really. And I and I believe enrollment is what about over half right now. So it's pretty close to where it would be normally at this time. We're you know we're still in mid-May. And uh, my other summer camp program, I'm just curious as to uh, what are you going to do on rainy days if you have all of your programs are trying to gear towards being outdoors? Well, we we have uh, spaces in the cafeteria and in the gymnasium at the middle school for the day camps and then at the high school for the sports programs, um, the gymnasium and a few other spots. So we'll be able to continue okay. where we have adequate spacing between individuals. Does so anybody else have questions that they'd like to ask about the summer camp programs? Because uh, you know, they go to sports programs, youth sports, than other programs. Is there any questions people have on those? Swimming, get to the pools. Get to the pools? Do you want to swim uh, you do a go ahead? Yeah, go ahead if you have any general statement or general comments about the pool operations. Sure. Yeah, I, we are projecting that the pools will run very similar to how they ran last year. Uh, we had designated swim lap times uh, for adults and we had open swim. We weren't able to provide swimming lessons. Uh, again, as I stated earlier, I, I'm hopeful that maybe toward the end of the summer that might be a possibility, but we just don't know at, that, at this point. Uh, there is also a possibility that we'll be able to increase the number of swimmers per lane. Uh, last year we were uh, for lap swimmers uh, to two instead of one. Last year we were restricted to just one per, per lane. Uh, our revenues actually last year were, were pretty good uh, considering uh, every, you know, everything that happened. Uh, the Tritons used the uh, pool at Mill River uh, in the early morning hours, so which had helped our revenue. And uh, then our membership, I think we're, we're up and daily fee were up as well. So that was good. So basically the same, excuse me, it's basically the same uh, sort of structure that we did last year for the pools will, will happen again this summer. Are Tritons coming back again this year? I um, haven't heard from them. They'll probably make that decision at the end of the month. Yeah, I was just curious because it looked like you had cut out morning lap swim time. Last year we cut out the, the early morning laps on correct, and that's when the Tritons were in at Mill River, right? Uh, yeah. In my last comment on swimming, uh, and we'll see if there's anybody else has anything to say on that, and we'll go to golf. Um, as far as uh, being somebody who swims at Hampshire Athletic, they um, are now at two per lane, and uh, informed me that virtually all public pools are now. Uh, two per lane that the wise and others that they consult with have gone back to two per lane, right. which would have a capacity and an income benefit. Uh, anything else on pools? I don't want to get into the minutia too much and delay. Um, and the other uh, then is the golf course. You, um, seemed to go well last year because it was a sport that people could participate in comfortably. Yeah, golf revenues uh, were up, uh, rounds were up. Um, it was an interesting uh, kind of dynamic that happened at golf courses across the country where for many years, golf uh, participation rates have been down. And uh, this year they, um, they really spiked up. And again, it was largely due because to the fact that it was an outdoor activity that was safe to participate in, you know, during the part of the pandemic. And I think it kind of sparked people's interest, if you will, back in, in golf. And um, we've got a lot of new golfers, I know at Cherry Hill. And we have a lot of golfers who have come back, who may have golfed, you know, 10 years ago, put away the clubs and 
thought, hey, I need to get outside now or I need to get away <laughs> from the rest of the family or whatever. But we have youth, we have women, and, and as well as men, we're just a good cross section of um, individuals coming out to play golf now, which is exciting. So that's been good. So let me see if there are any other follow up uh, questions. Uh, and I'm not seeing any hands going up from the committee. Uh, I wish that I had had more time to, uh, this uh, last uh, couple of weeks had been really sort of over the top and I would have spent a little bit more time going through the budget in detail as I had in prior years, did not get the chance. If I think of other things that are just small information pieces that I need to plug in um, as I, um, work on the report, I'll certainly uh, pose questions to Sean, if that's okay, and uh, see what we can get as answers. I see two other hands up, though, so go back to Dorothy again, and then to Lynn. I have a question about the waiting pool. Uh, is it open, and under what circumstances? Because uh, I understand why you're not giving swim lessons, but uh, it's a great loss. Uh, I first came to Amherst out of, from coming out of town to do baby swim lessons with my granddaughter. And um, I love to swim the pool and I love the waiting pool. Uh, is the waiting pool going to be open or is it limited? Well, we have just one waiting pool now and it's at Mill River and it will also, it'll be open. It was open last year. So yes, we have, definitely will, it will be open. What? Unmute, please. It's been a problem for me today. Um, I'm I'm actually not going to ask any questions, but it seems like we're coming to the end. And I specifically asked since this not only was Barbara's last day on Wednesday, and therefore she came back just today, specially for us, and then we delayed her for 20 minutes but we want to offer some thanks on behalf of the town council for your amazing work with us over the years. Um, Barbara is from San Diego. Uh, she started out doing recreation activities in the army and Navy. And uh, in 1986 to 89 in Korea and Japan as a civilian employee. And then she moved on to the Pioneer Valley Girl Scouts, which finally for me solves the question of where have I seen Barbara before? And that was it. Uh, she then worked at Tapestry Health in Northampton and then came to us uh, to work at LSSE, uh, now obviously Amherst Recreation. Uh, she became department head and recreation director over four years ago. And as mentioned here, uh, based on a strategic plan, uh, that they're now in the second year of. LSSE has changed its name. Um, she's done a lot to respond to the COVID uh, situation in our town and make it a much more uh, optimal situation for many, many people, um, including working at Cherry Hill and um, managing and making sure our pools and were open for swimming and our uh, parks and so forth. Uh, she lives in Amherst, and I also um, would occasionally see Barbara when uh, we, when I was um, at various Saturday activity events, mostly around Halloween, and uh, you know she and other people would drive up with uh, all kinds of things where they could help uh, kids make scarecrows and other kinds of Halloween uh, items, and also have a snack and. Um, you know, this is Saturday, not a regular work day. And so I really think what it does is capsul capsulizes for me what many residents would say about Barb, and that is she always has gone above and beyond to ensure that children from low-income households were able to participate in all activities throughout LSSE, now Amherst Recreation. So Barbara, we want to thank you for your many years of service with us and for leaving Amherst Recreation in better shape than when you arrived. 
Um, thank you so much, uh, Lynn, very much appreciated. And um, what it, you know, it's just been a great opportunity and, and I just feel very fortunate and blessed to have been able to serve this community and live here. I mean, it's a rare combination and um, it's just been a great run. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So we wish you uh, well, and uh, we hope that uh, you've uh, let Dave Zomack know what he's really in for for the summer. Oh, I have. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Best wishes for whatever you're doing next. You bet. Thank you again. Okay, thank you. So, um, with that, I think that where we wanted to go next was to the library, correct? And uh, we had, uh, I hope that everybody had uh, received the library budget and had a chance to look at it and has it available if need be. But um, I'll ask Sharon if she has any introductory comments that you'd like to uh, make. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I, I, I have a presentation. And so I thought I would share my screen um, to show you some pretty pictures and give you a brief uh, presentation. Okay. Um, thank you for having me. So we are proposing, the library trustees are proposing a $2,722,673 operating budget for FY22 with $2,086,211 coming from the town's appropriation. Um, the town appropriation is only used for staff salaries and benefits uh, and the months and library rent that we pay to the town. Uh, the appropriation doesn't fund any other part of the library's operation. Operations. We have budgeted for a state aid award of $88,272, um, but I do believe that cherry sheet uh, figure is low. The legislature is in the process of uh, approving an increase to that line. And 8.5% of our operating budget, our, our FY22 income, will come uh, from fundraising and fees, which I'll talk about uh, a bit more in, in a bit. Our endowment, let me move you all over here. So our endowment continues to climb quite, climb quite rapidly. As of April 30th, the value was $9,659,447. Uh, and that's the highest it's been since at least uh, FY05. Um, that being said, the draws that we take annually are based on a 12 quarter average uh, of, of the value. So this way, extreme highs and extreme lows in the market don't um, adversely affect our draws. Also on this slide on the bottom is a chart showing our draw rates going back to FY11. Um, and for FY22, we're looking at a 4% draw rate, uh, which will make up 11.7% of our budget. The endowment is used for uh, the expenses such as our maintenance for both the Jones and the North Amherst Library building, utilities at both the Jones and the North Amherst Library, um, insurance at both the Jones and the North Amherst Library, our CW Mars annual fee, and an annual software agreement um, licenses that we have to pay for. Our Woodbury Fund is also doing very well as of April 1st. Uh, its value was $780,430. Again, that's the highest it's ever been. Woodbury Funds are also drawn at a 4% draw rate every year, equaling about $26,000. And these funds are used for programming and circulating materials. I'm also very excited to report that our fundraising efforts are the most successful they have ever been. As of April 30th, we had raised $138,712 towards our $150,000 goal. And we, we have a, um, what is this, this is May, so we have a, a month and a half left in another letter that will be going out. Um, all of our fundraising monies are used for 
the fun stuff. Um, so programming for all ages, whether it's youth, teens, or adults, uh, it's for the branches, it's for ESL, it's for um, the Burnett Gallery and special collections, um, but it's also used for circulating materials, books, and all of our digital collections and magazines, databases, things like that. And uh, I want to take this minute to thank all of our donors. Every single dollar matters, and um, it truly affects the quality of life here in Amherst. Looking at our FY22 expenses, 79% of our operating budget is allocated towards uh, personnel and benefits. Um, because the town doesn't appropriate an amount equal to 100% of all of our wages, we use our state aid award to fill uh, the gap. Uh, we'll talk more about salaries in a minute. Um, the next big ticket item is circulating materials um, over here in the circle on the right. Uh, for FY22, in order to remain certified, we'll have to spend a minimum of $227,000 on circulating materials, again, such as books, DVDs, things like that. So here is a snapshot of our summary page, just so you can see at a glance our FY22 expenses up top uh, and our FY22 revenue sources. So expense highlights include uh, us budgeting for a 6.6%, where's 6 point? No, a 6% increase in operations. Uh, that's right there. Uh, a 6.7% increase in maintenance and a 5% increase in utilities. And then we are level funding programming uh, at $30,000. Under revenue sources, we're showing this in, in yellow, highlighted is the 2.1% increase to the town's appropriation, uh, a 9.6% reduction to the endowment draw, and a 50% cut to uh, the amount of money we expect to take in in fees, and that's only because we're not sure when we're going to be able to reopen our meeting rooms um, for use by the public. We are also budgeting for an increased reliance on fundraising. Um, uh, that's uh, my little cursor. That's these two lines right here, uh, whether it's through private donations to the friends or through special events uh, like the Sammies, we'll be able to bring those back next year. And the friends mini golf event, the friends are also have also scheduled for, I think it's August 28th, an actual uh, golf tournament um, at the Amherst Golf Club. Stay tuned for more details. Okay, staffing. I want to talk a little bit about staffing now. Um, for FY22, we are uh, budgeting for a 4.8% increase in salaries. And the reason for that, uh, the reason it's so high is because the town has adopted a new really great wage chart for our hourly part-time staff. Um, so even though the proposal and the result is pretty expensive, I did advocate for its passage quite extensively. And so I created this really small chart here to give you a quick visual on how the new wage chart will affect the library's part-time staff. Um, so here we have four library shelvers that are now at level three. We have one maintenance assistant that's at level three right now. We have 19 library technicians that are now at level four and two reference librarians that are at level six. But starting on July 1st, our shelvers. In the new scheme, they're now going to be uh, considered level ones. Um, they'll be making a minimum of thirteen fifty an hour, and then in January, uh, they will go up to fourteen dollars and twenty five cents an hour. So that's a seventy five uh, seventy five cent increase uh, in six months. Our maintenance assistant uh, will be a level three in July. And we'll go from $13.66 to $16.61 uh, per hour. And then in January, they'll be bumped up to $17.11. Uh, and that is a $3.45 hour increase over six months. Uh, our 19 library technicians. So on July 
first, they're still going to be a level four. Um, this person in particular is going to go from 1372 an hour up to 1672 an hour. And then in January, they'll be bumped up again to 1722. Uh, and that's a $3.50 per hour increase in six months. And then our reference librarians, they're going to be uh, at a level seven starting in July, and they'll go from 1987 per hour to 2619 per hour. And then in January, they'll be bumped up to 2698. And that's a $7 per hour increase. Um, so just a quick shout out to the personnel board of Amherst, uh, HR director Donna Ray Keneally, and of course, town manager Paul Bockelman um, for adopting this chart. Um, I, I think it's really going to make a big difference to people's lives. Um, and that's... That's the end of my overview, and I'll stop screen sharing so you can see each other again. Hi. Hey. So um, I actually should have said something at the beginning of the discussion. I'm going to catch up to it now because I had uh, I think today just uh, has gotten out of hand totally for me in some respects, but. Um, uh, I did want to remind people that my wife works part-time at the North Amherst Library, a small number of hours per week, and that um, I have consulted with the Ethics Commission about this and filed a notice with the town clerk advising them um, after my consultation so that it, uh, the it's available as a matter of public record. Um, because, um, the uh, decisions made about uh, the library budget um, are not made by the council and we are only voting a bottom line on a budget. Um, it actually um, leaves me in a position where I can continue to participate. If there come any votes at any time where uh, a decision of the council would affect um, the compensation um, that my wife receives, then um, I would have to um, step away from the process and um, not participate. And I'm very vigilant at that. Uh, when um, Select Board did a discussion about the uh, minimum wage discussion um, is an example of when I, um, made myself absent and excused myself from participation in the select board um, at that time and actually left the meeting entirely uh, is an example. But I, I just wanted to make sure that all of you were aware that that conflict, that the, the, the potential conflict exists and that I am being very vigilant. So um, that, uh, let me turn it, recognize Lynn. Cindy, was there someone specifically assigned to this that has questions before me? Um, the one, and I've been watching hands, it was Dorothy, I believe, who was assigned to this. Okay. Good. Dorothy. Um, well, I would say that we've just had a very good overview uh, from Sharon, um, which kind of put all the facts out there. Um, I think it's it's of interest to note that the um, uh, how the staff is funded, um, and that the, the without the fundraising, without the endowments that and the Woodbury Fund, uh, the library would have a very difficult time. Um, those funds are in good shape now, um, and um, given the situation we're in, I think that we could say that the budget looks pretty firm. The one thing that we that's not clear, of course, at this time is the whole question of receiving the money for the capital project um, and probably will receive only one payment this year of, I guess it's 2.7 million or something. Um, and so that could cause some kind of a problem. But, um, you know, I, it, it sounds, the budget in some ways sounds very similar to that of the Council of Aging the meeting that I spent the morning at, which is that the town pays most of the staff, not all, the state money comes in to supplement that money to pay for staff and that other activities and programs are done by private fundraising. Um, but the library is very lucky to have an endowment, which is in good shape. So that's really basically my report on this. 
So thank you. Um, so um, maybe I just wasn't paying attention and that is possible, uh, but could you talk a little bit more about the personnel board decisions, what they were based on? And oh. Paul might even elaborate on what other departments uh, those reviews ha will um, and have affected. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm not even sure that, you know, I went, I went to the meetings. I have not, I only compared it to my budget. I, I, I don't know how it's affecting others. You could quit call bar back. I, I think Amherst Rec is, is the other department that, um, that it affects, but I, it's, I think that this question is really more for Paul. Sorry, Paul. So I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, so yeah, for a couple, several years now, we've been trying to get the lowest level employees up to the $15 an hour. Um, and it sounds simple, but it's not because there's the, the, the trickle effect because it impacts everybody above them. So the, the personnel board has been working on this, has actually engaged a consultant to help look, it through, look through it. So we have a process in place to get these, these our lowest paid employees um, up to a, a more reasonable wage. And that's been a high priority. I think I mentioned this in last year's budget as well. Um, we're actually, I think this is a really good plan we have moving forward. Uh, the biggest impacts are on the library and on recreation. They're the ones who utilize the most part-time employees. Um, it doesn't impact the other employees as, as much. Um, and so, so that's why uh, it's impactful on Sharon's budget. But the overall mission has been in working again closely with the personnel board has been to uh, get these lowest paid employees up and then hold um, people up the line um, harmless in essence. So previously what we were doing is we we're just taking as we made progress on the minimum wage in the state, we would just take off the lowest, um, the lowest um, rating and then but we, we wanted to get a program in place that really impacted every, addressed everyone's um, schedule, the entire schedule. So with the chair's permission, I'd like to continue on that particular issue. Um, so um, I'm assuming that when the personnel board and their consultant looked at this, they looked at comparables. I, mm -hmm. I am very pleased to see these changes. Uh, it's, um, a very serious challenge to many organizations um, to get to you know, the high point of the minimum wage, uh, but a very necessary one. And so, uh, but I'm assuming they, you know, if you had a consultant, they were dealing with comparables and uh, so forth. So I just wanna say, I, I support this. I was just very interested to know more about it. But that gives me, brings me to my other question, which is really about uh, the issue of part-timers unbenefit and whether we're making any progress in that area. Is that a question for me too? Um, let me see, I have to go back to my slide to find out, let's see. Yeah, so slowly I'm chipping away as um, the more full timers I can have uh, and the more uh, part, I call them over 20s and under 20s. So the, they're, they're part timers that are over 20s, the, the more of them that I can turn into full timers, um, the less I need to rely on the part timers. So, uh, um, yeah, so this year I was able to boost another person up. I've got four of those over 20s left and, and my goal will be to make all of those complete full-timers and, and that will reduce my reliance on, on the uh, part-time hourlies. Um, but I'll never, uh, I will always need them. The library will always need them. It's a seven day per week operation, 64 hours, uh, open hours under normal circumstances. Um, and it, it, it's it's a complicated scheduling beast, um, uh, and having having part timers is just really necessary. It, you know, people get sick, go on vacation. I need to be able to call somebody in at the last minute. That kind of a thing. So, yeah. Lynn, anything else? Nope, that's it. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, first, I'll follow up on Lynn's. How many? Under 20s do you have? 
Um, because that's the group that gets nothing except for a sick leave. You know, so the part timer over 20 gets prorated benefits. Am I correct? Right. And the under 20s, Paul, I think Paul can explain more. So it's they have they have sick and and personal time uh, as well. And uh, so, yeah. So for next year, we'll have 26 of them. So in I'm just looking at your trend chart, that's one person lower. So one person lower than current and then a couple lower than earlier. So that's the expense, at least in my mind, that's the more expensive conversion. And then for the people, it may be more meaningful because that's when it triggers health insurance, correct? Oh, uh can you explain your, yeah, so under 20, the, the town doesn't uh, have to give them health insurance. It's for the over 20s, correct? When I said it's more expensive, it's the per hour work goes up when you add those other benefits in. So it's coming out of different buckets. So it, seem, it seems to me that it, that when I'm in buckets, like one is a wage line and one is yeah. a one is a pension, what you're contributing for pension, what you're contributing for health insurance. You don't contribute, you're not contributing toward a pension accumulation either when they're under 20. Am I correct? Correct. Okay. So, so that to me is the bigger, I mean, I understand the over 20 going to full, but the converting the under 20 to even be 20 plus is a, a big boost for people over time. And, and are, do you expect to have an ability to convert some of those to the 20 plus? Uh, that would require a, a larger town appropriation. Okay. Then my, then looking at, you mentioned it quickly when you went through the budget numbers um, that you're anticipating or you're projecting a pretty big increase in the Friends Woodbury contribution and Sammy's and other fundraising. Well, one was like an 86% increase and the other was 11. What happens if you don't get those increases? You know, where is, what, what do you do within your budget? So that's one question. And then the other is, do you expect, are you expected to be fully open for all of FY22? So is this, F starting in July, you think the library will be back to the doors are open? Uh, so the, f the first question, what if we don't reach the fundraised amount, then we, you know, it depends on what, what point in the year we're at. Um, you know, we have constant conversations with the board of trustees and, and we figure out where to get uh, additional funds from uh, or what kind of cuts to make. Um, and then whether or not we're fully open tomorrow, the Board of Trustees will be looking at a, a proposal to reopen starting June 14th. Um, and it will be it will be slow. It we won't be going right back to 64 hours a week open. Um, and so I, I don't know when we'll be fully reopened again, but, um, but we're, at least we're starting in that path. Thank you. Okay, Dorothy, if Kathy's done. Thank you. Uh, this is a question really towards Paul. Um, again, I'm applying a New York City question to a very small town, Amherst, comparatively. But when I got ready to retire from New York City, I was able to buy back time from a lot of jobs, anything I had done for the city or the state, um, part-time, subbing, whatever, I was able to, with a cash payment, buy back that time. Is that something that's possible for, say, a library part-timer who put in many years and then gets a full-time job and is in part of the pension system? Are they allowed to buy back time to improve their pension benefits? Only if they were eligible for those years of service. Um, with, if they didn't contribute to the retirement system, they would have to make their contributions at that point. But that's controlled by the state pension system that we're in the county pension system. That's nothing the town controls. Okay. So if someone were in that situation, they were right to the Hampshire County Retirement Board. Okay, but theoretically, it could be possible with some kind of payment that they could, if that's under the rules of the county pension system. Right. So the county pension system does not cover part-time employees, though. Oh, so they could not buy back part-time. Right. I don't think that qualifies for service. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, other questions from 
the committee. I want to uh, just say to the public that I'm going to do um, public comment in several different segments today. I know that we have some members of the um, council who are in, in public attendance too. Um, so if there are members of the public who would like to um, ask um, questions or uh, make comments in, regarding the library, um, they should um, please raise their hands, um, and uh, if I uh, and I will keep an eye on that um, and uh, open it up to public comment for that segment. Um, Kathy, you have your hand up. Though. It's just a quick question. I should know the answer to this, but are all of our town employees or all the library employees covered under Social Security? Do we contribute? An employer share. So there, when you're under 20, I just want to stress that to people. When you're under 20, you're under, you're under a state pension system, and you're not, you know. So unless you've worked your re required 40 quarters at some other job, you're not getting social security either. Um, where that's not true of all public sector, but it is true of Amherst, is what I'm hearing. Are you under? Are we contributing for Medicare? Yeah. Yes. Um, and if you're under 20, um, or if you're, if you're doing temporary work, you still pay into what we call um, an OBRA plan, which is a, an alternative type of retirement plan. Um, but it's completely employee, employee uh, contributions. I had one of those when I was the under at UMass, and it returned at a point insurance rate interest rates were quite high it returned so little money that i thought of it as a taking of mine i got it all back when i left yeah yeah, yeah. it's more it's more of a temporary to roll over into something else at a later date is is how i've seen it used okay anything else from the committee or anybody from uh who's watching the public and would like to uh it, be recognized and regarding the library only. So um, I think I don't see anything further. Is there um, any concluding comments? Otherwise, I very much appreciate uh, the presentation of the budget and it uh, is very helpful for us to understand it and the, that the written budget and what you presented on the screen was very helpful. So thank you thank all you. so much. Thank you. Be well. So uh, at this point, I think that we're uh, now going on to the uh, police department under the uh, listing that you had given Sean at the beginning. And I just want to make one um, statement um, just for everybody and the public uh, to recognize, and that is that uh, this uh, finance committee meeting is a part of a routine procedure that we have every year with the budget process um, has us meeting with each department head as you've just observed um, for recreation and the library. And we're now gonna be, re uh, the police chief will be with us now. Uh, this is not about um, the uh, community safety working group proposal for the $130,000 that is being proposed in social services uh, for um, the next steps um, there. That has been postponed until after the town council meeting on May 24th, at which the um, Community Service Working Group presentation will be made uh, to the Town Council. Uh, so uh, we will have a follow-up meeting of the Finance Committee to take out um, that issue um, of the Community Services and Social Services uh, segment of the Community Services Budget uh, it's now scheduled for May 27th at 5.30. And this is um, about the police department budget as um, it has been um, specified by and proposed by the town manager. 
Uh, with that, I first will ask either um, Sean or Paul if they have any further things that they want to say in, on that. And if yeah, I was going to say um, uh, Scott is going to give a, probably a brief overview of the um, department. And then we did receive a number of questions that I was going to, once uh, Chief Livingstone is done with the overview, um, I was going to just go through those questions and, and the responses to those questions, if that's okay. Okay, that's um, fine. So, Chief, welcome. Thank you, Andy, and, and good to see everybody. Um, just one question, maybe to Sean and Andy. Would you prefer I go communication center, animal welfare, and then police um, third? And because I'm typically responsible for giving overviews of all three of those. Would that be easier? Knock out the, the smaller ones first. Is that, um, that's fine with me, unless there's objection from anybody else. Okay, I mean, I'm fine with that too. Okay. Sure, and I've also invited Mike Curtin, who is our communications supervisor on board to answer any specific questions that I might not be able to answer uh, specific to the communication center. Mike's a wealth of information and probably the best communication supervisor in the state. So if I don't have the answer, I'm sure he will. So um, with that, I'll start with the communication center um, manpower. So they are funded or we are employing 12 full-time um, emergency dispatchers of which Mike is one of them. So even though he's a communication supervisor, he still has dispatch responsibilities and we this year added a lead dispatcher position. So that individual oversees things when either I'm on vacation or Mike is on vacation or, or not available. So um, both those persons are included in the full-time 12 member allotment of the communication center. Um, part of the accomplishments is the annual grants we receive for the communication center. So. You know, there's a training, excuse me, a training grant of 17,000 that's provided from the state for mandatory training of the dispatchers. And then we receive an additional uh, incentive and support grant. And that is something we get every year. Um, the amounts of those fluctuate a little bit from time to time, but not a great deal. And the department support and incentive grant this year is $109,000 and some change. Uh, what we use some of that money from is to fund one of the full-time positions of the dispatch center. So, and then additional money is used for overtime and that sort of thing um, from both of those grants. Um, we continue to serve and Mike, you might have to correct me on this because I know things are changing, but as one of the two statewide hazardous materials dispatch centers, is that correct? That's correct, Chief. Um, they are looking at for FY22, moving the hazmat dispatch over to the MEMA. Uh, Chief Nelson could speak more on that, but my understanding is that it's gonna move over to MEMA. So we would lose the, I think it's about 10,000 in the revolving fund from uh, the hazmat dispatch for FY22, which we use to buy chairs and miscellaneous equipment. Thank you. Um, other accomplishments from the Dispatch and Communication Center. So we continue to staff at, at the mandated 12 numbers, um, do their annual trainings. The, we've had a couple of personnel changeovers at the Communication Center. Um, it's always a challenge to try and find somebody when we're replacing those positions. It's, you know, it really is not an easy job to do. Um, it's stressful at times and you know, you're working overnights for the most part beginning and you're working weekends and holidays and that sort of thing. So, you know, it's a tough job. So not everybody is cut out for it. So when we do have openings, sometimes it's relatively difficult to fill those positions. Um, I can't think of a dispatch center, at least in this area, hiring at one time or another. So that's that continues to be a great accomplishment, yet something that we need to be concerned about in years in the future. Um, you know, we took over responsibilities um, to assist Hampshire College as they transitioned out of um, a security agency. So we 
are basically uh, handling calls for Hampshire College as well. Um, long chain, key challenges, long range objectives. Uh, again, making sure that we have it staffed 24 seven, 365 with the properly trained people. Um, you know, part of that is training new individuals when they do come on board. And again, um, it would, it's not unusual to train somebody, get them completely accustomed to what their responsibilities are. They come in and dispatch for a month or two months and then they realize maybe this isn't for them. So that's, that's happened on occasion. And uh, that makes it for a little bit more challenging for Mike and his staff. Um, you know, annually we put in there about looking for regional dispatch communication center regional uh, attempts. Um, there are a few here and there across the state, not many of them, but it's been difficult for us to try and find partners um, who are interested in regionalizing with us. Um, so there may be questions about that and I'm sure we can answer those. Um, objectives from the previous year, um, we were able to fill that lead dispatch position with one of our in-house dispatchers who was very knowledgeable. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this, um, somebody who can fill in for Mike when Mike's away for trainings and or vacations and that sort of thing. So that was something that we had been trying to do for a couple of years and we, we accomplished that this year. Um, again, meeting the state requirements for training um, is ongoing. Um, and we are in the process and I believe it was one of the town managers mandates that we um, start investigating and looking into a site for a backup communication center, uh, which we have been working on since oh last fall, I believe. And we are in the process of getting that up and running and that's gonna be located at the North Amherst Fire Station. So in the case of something catastrophic happening in this facility, the dispatch center's on the third floor of the police station. If something really crazy uh, happened here, then we would be able to move all of our dispatch, um, both police, fire and EMS right to that location without any interruption in services and concerns. So those are some of the things we're doing. Um, I think that's about it for now for communication center. Mike, did I miss anything or is there anything you wanted to add? I'll just add that the uh, backup center is pretty much operational right now. Um, we're waiting for a couple pieces of equipment uh, one being the new phone system the town's going to install. And once the uh, fiber loop is all set up, we'll have even greater capability up there, redundancy. Um, the only thing that we won't ever have up there are 911 phones. So if we did have to vacate this location, our 911 calls would bring through to the Northampton State Police and they would be forwarded back to us up at the North Fire Station. But we're in tenfold better shape than we were six months ago with that setup. So pretty happy about that. Great, thank you. And there were a few um, a few questions. You mind, Andy, if I go ahead and... Um, yeah, I was gonna ask. Okay. So there were a couple of questions related to dispatch. Um, the first one was um, how much additional training would dispatchers need to differentiate calls requiring police for social services or, or EMTs or other types of um, responders? Um, Mike, do you wanna respond to that one? Sure, it would be minimal. I mean, that's what our job is. We're triaging calls all the time, um, sitting with different resources, whether it be animal welfare, DPW, uh, some calls we refer directly over to crisis. Uh, we have the luxury of having a, a station officer available to, available to bounce questions off of or send calls directly to. Um, usually we have, well, hopefully we have somebody in the fire department uh, if we have any medical issues, if we don't have to immediately dispatch on them. Uh, as far as a, a new social service, aspect of it uh, with policies and procedures in place, it would be a minimal transition. And as far as training, again, that's what we do. Okay. And then there was another question um, about the change in personnel costs for the dispatchers. Um, the question was noting that the change was 1.8% for FY22. Um, Mike, if you wanna to respond to that or I can read what you wrote, if that's easier. Uh, depends which response you got. The first one I, I misinterpreted what the, I thought it was something about the FY21, why we were running a little under budget. Um, for the the 1.8, that's pretty standard, but you can uh, read my response if you have it there. Yeah, um, you, so Mike provided the last several years of increases. 
Um, and, I, and I can send this out to the group after FY21 was a little bit larger than normal, but that was due to um, sort of a wider adjustment. Um, but Mike noted that 1.8% is about average and that it's maybe a little bit lower because of staff turnover. Um, and conversely, um, it, the, the more we retain staff, the higher that percentage will be because they'll be getting steps and, and colas and things of that nature. So it's a, it's a little bit of a opposite effect. Um, and then the last question, which we probably don't want to get into today, but this might be one of the ones that we want to wait until we come back to talk more about the community um, responder program, um, was plans for uh, future collaboration with the community responder, the CREST program. Um, and so I, I, unless I'll, I'll defer to Andy or Lynn if they want to talk about that today or wait until the end, um, to the end of May to talk about that more. Lynn, do you have I think that would be appropriate. To wait until, okay. Yes. I agree. Okay, and that's it for dispatch questions. Okay, I did have one dispatch question, but I see there's several others that um, are there. Pat? Yeah, I, I wanna go back to the Crest thing because I think it is appropriate to bring up issues in this meeting, even if they're hypothetical at this point. Uh, there's going to be an impact um, from the community safety working groups work. Um, and it looks like they want us to move to a CREST program. So not to include it as some questions uh, seems to me to, to, to limit what we're really talking about in a way that makes me uncomfortable. Uh, we're waiting till the very end of May to look, then to discuss something that may have a real and direct impact on the communication center, on the police department. So I'm uncomfortable with your decision, Andy, and your decision, Lynn. I just want it on the record. Uh, that's fine. I think you should state your question, Pat, but we're, we're trying to, um, first of all, provide an evening meeting for the Community Safety Working Group. We certainly hope that uh, representatives from our other first responders might be there as well. Uh, and I also just, again, remind you, we don't pass uh, or even make resolutions now uh, for recommendation until the end of hearing everybody, which will include the meeting with the Community Safety Working Group. Yeah, and I'm not thinking about making recommendations. I'm just saying that there is some potential impact on some questions that counselors might have uh, about this and an impact on communications mm -hmm. um, and training budgets and things like that. Um, so I'm just, I want to say that I'm uncomfortable with not being allowed to ask them. I don't have a specific question now beyond what do you see as potential impact uh, or increase in calls if there's collaboration between a, a program like CRESS and the, the current communication center. If you don't want to answer that, that's fine. But Andy, I think we should go ahead with that question. Yeah, I think that question is fine because oh. actually um, uh, there was actually a uh, response to that already, um, a little bit of uh, a brief response and it was made. And I think what you're asking is for just a little bit more detail and follow-up. Yes. So, yes. yeah. So, so is ahead. the question, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Andy. Is the question, Pat, do we anticipate there being more calls for service? Yes, uh, whether more calls for service or additional training needs for dispatchers. I know that Mr. Curtin said that, oh, well, we can distinguish those kinds of calls, but it's not even, you know, um, so I, I'm interested in if there were more people from the BIPOC, BIPOC community who would be willing to contact the communication center because there was a need that they, they for whatever reason right now feel um, unable to do. Uh, and I can't speak specifically to their reasons, but from listening, you can hear the kinds of um, limits that BIPOC people feel they have in engaging the police. So I think that potentially there could be impact on the communication center and I want to know if there's even been any thought to that. Does that make sense, Scott? Yeah. Um, 
I, I mean, I'm, Mike and I have certainly spoken about some of the questions we've been receiving specific to whether or not we'll see increases. We might see a slight intick and in request for services of that, but you know, one of the responsibilities, and they do train for this, is to kind of filter out what those calls would be. So, and I know I brought this up in a meeting with the community safety working group and probably other groups. You know, when we get requests for police responses to calls that end up being medical mental calls, they rarely come in as that. So we don't know, always find out as police officers even if what we respond to ends up being a medical mental call because sometimes it'll come in as a disturbance or a shoplifting call or you know even domestic violence calls will come in and then we'll realize, well, it wasn't really that, but it was more of a mental crisis type call. So, you know, I think the dispatchers, and Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but they do receive some training in that. They may be getting additional training in that. And that part of that's gonna come from the Mass State Police Reform Bill as well, because it's not just impacting Amherst, it's impacting the entire state. So Mike, if you wanna jump in. Sure, Chief. So we do receive uh, specialized training in mental health issues, uh, opioid crisis, um, people dealing with uh, PTSD, things like that. Um, one of the things that we run into is a lot of times we'll get called, um, not really for a police response, but the community doesn't know where else to go with things and they're having some type of crisis. So 911 is what they've been taught and what they you know, fall back on. So then it comes down to you know, triaging where should we go with this call. Um, many times it ends up just uh, with an officer going because we, we don't have a lot of other resources to send for an evaluation. Um, sometimes they end up going, uh, the ambulance gets called. Sometimes we just start with the ambulance because we can tell what's going on. Um, and again, there's people that uh, when they're at the end of their line, they don't know who else to call. They reach out to 911. We provide the best service we can at that point. Did, did that help, Pat? Unmute, Pat. Muted. Yes, that helps somewhat. Thank you both. You're welcome. So, Kathy? Uh, just um, building on Pat's question, but also for the discussion we're going to have on the 27th, um, I think what, what her question was opening up is at the current staffing level, if there's a volume increase, can it be handled would be one question. And secondly, if, if we're seeing we have a new workforce that we're aiming for and we're going to be building up. So we re um, having enough training protocols, and I think uh, Michael Curtin was talking about it, we might have to new, new regs are new. You know, when I think of this call goes here, this call goes there, what kinds of additional questions you need to ask as a dispatcher to get more to, to what the story is. Um, thinking through our, the amount of time and resources we would need to do from your experience to build up that capacity. Um, so when we have the other discussion on a, it, can this current workforce handle most of that with some manuals, training, rethinking, um, what is something I'd like to hear discussed when we have the other discussion in the context of it. Sure. You know, it's another work, it will be a new workforce. It's trying to think of what that and sort of time, time legs to, to build up some of these protocols, manuals, whatever there is. I don't know enough about what you, what you now do, um, but be thinking about answers to that kind of question for the 27th. Understood. I don't want, and again, I don't want to get into it too much or overstep my, my bounds here. But one of the things that we utilize, um, we have an emergency medical dispatch protocol, which is basically a step by step uh, flow chart of where to go with certain calls. Um, experience has a lot to do with it. Uh, we have a lot of uh, frequent callers that um, have some mental health issues that there's times that they're just looking for someone to talk to and you know, we've had dispatchers spend when possible, you know, 15 minutes just talking to somebody. And at the end, there's really no need for any service. And that happens um, frequently. Thank you. Anything else? 
<laughs> okay, um, Bob Hagner. Yeah, um, I, I have a, a small question and that's related to Hampshire College. Uh, have we, has the town seen any significant increase in costs associated with the Hampshire College situation? And um, if so, are we getting any payments from Hampshire College to cover those costs? And then the, the other thing is I have a, a, a comment, which is uh, part of my work before I retired was managing uh, large scale, scale hurricane recovery programs. And I had the misfortune to have to manage a call center for some of that time. So I do empathize with you on uh, staffing issues related to uh, your, your communication center. <clears throat> Great. I appreciate that. I mean, uh, staffing for communication centers nationwide has always been uh, very difficult. As far as Hampshire College, uh, we've worked out most of the bugs and those were uh, basically some phone issues and some uh, routing and 911 calls and things like that that started up there. The impact of the communication center has been pretty minimal. Um, we treat the calls that come to us um, and they have their procedures in place for when they call us as anybody from the South Amherst calling us and we dispatch the appropriate resources. Fire department and EMS have been going out there since I've been here 22 years ago. Um, so nothing's changed there with us. And it's the population is, uh, the student population is down there. So the uh, call volume yeah. um, has gone down appropriately. Yeah. Okay. I thank would you. just add, Robert, Bob, I would just add uh, the, the police calls are minimal. They still do have a uh, small security force. I think that number is 12. So they still respond to their own calls like stolen bicycles and lockouts and their own minimal noise disturbances. Pretty much the only time we get involved is if it's something where somebody would need to be cr criminally summoned for a charge or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. so the transition's been pretty easy. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I. how do we relate to UMass with regard to their emergency calls and 911? So the 911 calls that placed on campus are now coming to us. Um, if the people are using cell phones, there's still some on-campus phones and some emergency phones that are ringing to their communication center and then they call us. So it's a little bit of a delay there, but the majority of calls come to us. Uh, we need to determine whether it's fire EMS related and then we handle it and call EMS and tell them we're doing it. If it's police related, we gather a uh, certain uh, pertinent information, um, weapons, names, phone numbers, and then we transfer those calls over to UMass um, as you know, they have a full-fledged uh, PD over there. They handle their own accidents and um, things that happen on campus. But I'd say all in all, we have a great working relationship. Um, things are pretty seamless. They have a pretty senior staff over there that are versed in what information we need when they call us. And we try to uh, reciprocate that when we're calling them, if that answers it. So I want to push further on the relationship with UMass because, um, you know, I frankly never thought about this until we had the blizzard of um, October, whatever that was, the October blizzard. And that is that, you know, they have their own electric plant. So basically while everything surrounding the campus was without power, they weren't. And so when I think about an emergency backup location, I think about the Amherst campus as being prime for that, even though I know the Amherst campus has their own emergency backup location for other stuff off campus. But as you explored the backup and took it to North Station, was there any conversation about having our backup system somewhere on the UMass Amherst campus? So a couple of sites were looked at. Um, originally the DPW, because they have, they'll have the infrastructure, the, um, they already had the infrastructure set up with the phones and things like that. Moving the stuff onto campus, uh, the, the phone lines, the radios, things like that was something that um, was discussed. But Amherst Fire, uh, Amherst North Station, they have the backup generator. They actually have a radio tower directly at the station that was easy enough to tie into to provide uh, for some redundancy there. We do, our, like our main radio tower without getting too specific, we have a microwave. And if this station, if we couldn't be here, um, reaching that tower might be difficult if certain systems were shut down. Um, the, the bunks that are set up, the shower facilities, the kitchen facilities that are all up in North Station, uh, being far enough away from 
the center of town in case something was happening in the center of town were all things that we took into consideration. Um, and again, the 1C fiber is in place. Um, the North Station besides 911 phones will be pretty self-sufficient. We've already had to use it once. Uh, we had some UPSs go unexpectedly. We had to use it um, very short notice and it took about 10 minutes to get it up and running. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, trying to think of uh, Bob asked my question about Hampshire College, and uh, I'm assuming that when we're listing other communities on page 121, where the statistics are given for service provided in other towns are listed, that those are ambulance calls, and that uh, it's um, therefore going to be billed through um, the mechanisms we have for billing uh, those costs for ambulance responses. Is that correct assumption, Sean? Uh, yeah, I believe those are ambulance calls. So whether it's our uh, agreements we have or through insurance billing, yeah, that's how we would uh, recoup money from those. Okay, thank you. Um, so we should go on to facilities. And what I'm gonna do on public comment again is uh, when we get to uh, completed all sections of the uh, department budget, I will then look to the attendee uh, list to see if there are any requests for co uh, public comment or public. And that way I'll get to any counselors who are in that group. Um, so I uh, just wanna remind people of my intentions on that. Um, so uh, Chief, I guess, uh, any, anything on the building or the facility? Um, I don't typically do the facilities aspect of it. Um, I can fill you in, gen in general um, comments about what was replaced. And I think you've got the information about the chiller and stuff, but. Um, Scott, uh, Chief Livingstone and um... Andy, if you're okay with waiting on doing police facilities till we do um, general government, I'm just thinking of the time and thinking about fire as well. Um, Jeremiah is really the person we'll want to to be here when we talk about the police facility. Um, so we were going to just go, if it's okay with you, just go to animal welfare. That's fine with me. If, um, if there's anybody who's on the committee who has a different view on it, but I think that that suggestion makes sense and based on experience with uh, JCPC, um, that's, that's Jeremiah was the one who provided all of the information at that point for JCPC. Thank you. So animal welfare, by the way, I like the picture of uh, our animal welfare officer there in the uh, budget book. Uh, yeah, Carol, Carol's got quite the array of photos. So it was difficult picking just one because she's, well, she's got a lot of them. Um, in any case, yeah, I'll try and be quick with animal welfare. Um, you know, Carol is the, the go-to go person and continues to be for anything animal related. Um, you know, her accomplishments probably could fill a page, but, you know, continues to do all inspections, not just for um well for all farms so she actually goes to farms and does all the inspections there she's required by the state helps them out with anything that they need and make sure that people are taking care of their animals the way they're supposed to um which is something i don't think a lot of people realize she's that's part of her responsibility and job but uh additionally she's licensed over 1300 dogs which is 85 percent. i think it's down from where she's been in the past and she wanted me to make sure that I pointed out it wasn't her fault, it was COVID's fault. So people weren't able to get to the, you know, licensing, proper licensing persons to get that accomplished. So um, she continues to want to get it 100% compliance and dog licensing. You know, she's, most of her calls, it seems like recently have all involved things about because so many people were either working from home this past year um, you know, they're out and about with their dog. She responded to, a, you know, probably many that aren't even listed on her call sheets because she wouldn't always tell us when, what she was doing. But, um, you know, enforcing the leash laws has really become 
I don't know if I'd say it was an issue in this town, but it was stressful for her. Um, but she did a great job with it and she would keep me informed on uh, very specific parts of town, Amethyst, Brook being part, and of course, some of our other recreational areas where there have been some difficulties enforcing those laws. So we are having communications, myself, her, Dave Zomack, about how to make her job easier and, and maybe, um, you know, who else can assist her in that type of enforcement. So that is something we're working on. Um, you know, I know we were going to be looking at building an intern program from people from the University of Mass or Hampshire College. And that's something that's still going to be in the works as soon as COVID allows us to do that. So, you know, um, she's got friends in other parts of the state who have had successful internship programs, and we're looking to do that as well. Um, you know, we do have two current, and I'll move on to um, prior year objectives. We do have two regional uh, members of the dog facility that we have out on the university property out by the wastewater treatment plant with both Hadley and Northampton utilizing our facility as well. And she oversees all of that. Um, you know, Carol does an outstanding job when we do have animals that need placement in new homes for whatever reason. She's got a glowing record, 100% placement for animals that need homes. She does it for other towns as well, whether it be Leverage, Shootsbury. People will bring dogs to our facility just to find new homes and Carol handles all of that. Um, you know, again, she's working hard to get the 100% dog licensing fee accomplished. She did a great job working with the dog park um, task force group for um, Amherst's first dog park. And I know she was pretty excited about getting that completed. Um, I uh, guess that's about it. I'll stop there if there's any questions specific. She's probably in the building listening if I know Carol, but um, I'll answer any questions to the best of my ability if it's specific to animal complaints or animal welfare. Kathy? Um, I, I too love the picture with the owl, um, you know, giving you a sense that it's not just dogs um, and our thing. So I have a question on the um, complaints about off leash and it's not so much the Carol side, but um, I had a couple people contact me on what is our leash law and was this or that a violation and this was in a children's playground. So it was a kind of an easy one to answer. But I'm wondering if there would be a better way to post some of those than have people have to look up a bylaw or find out what's the leash law. So to have it, um, I, I don't know what even what I'm suggesting, or maybe there is one already, because I, you know, I said, this is the law and I think called the police department, you know, I wasn't quite sure how to respond, but I realized that I was just copying a bylaw around leashes rather than a, a Q and A, where can I, can I walk my dog? Where can I walk my dog? We don't have it posted. I live up in North Amherst and we've got Robert Cross Trail. We've got some crossing trails. It's not posted and most people are pretty good. Um, yes. The dog is off leash and they see you coming and they put it quickly back on leash. And it's, but every once in a while, it's the kind of dog that the minute they see you, it's all over you. Um, before, we, so it's just so it's more. A, how do we help it not be a one-person operation to afford, inform people on what the rules are, but either have all of us know about it or have the dog owners know about it? Was my question. Right. So those are some of the things we've been discussing, Kathy and um, Paul and I and Dave Zomek and Carol met uh, two weeks ago to discuss that very specific topic. Um, because you're right, they're very. There are different rules that say Mill River Rec when and they post it, you know, you're not supposed to have your dog inside the fence area where the Little League ballpark is and people violate that. So Carol patrols that area as best she can. And she's, she reports that it's typically the same people violating it. And she has issued citations when she's had to, she's very reluctant to do that. Amethyst Brook is, well, Amethyst Brook, quite frankly, is our biggest problem. Um, you know, people, a lot of people think the voice command is the same thing as leash law and it's not. And so she spends a lot of time educating people about that. You know, we're looking at posting more of those locations with actual signage 
Sometimes the sign, we have posted them in the past and the signs get stolen or removed. Um, you know, Kendrick Park, we get a lot of complaints now about dogs off, off leash. So all of that we're looking at and we're gonna be meeting again next, um, next month to further those discussions, all right? More signage, how we can help Carol. We've had discussions about maybe we can incorporate our parking facility people transitioning a little bit about um, off leash licensing, that sort of thing. So those are, and the conservation guys that work up at Puffers, the same thing, having them, give them a little bit more leeway if they needed to write a citation, that sort of thing. And I'm just wondering, you know, even on a, the call I had or the email, um, our, our website gets better and better, Paul, when I do a query of it, but, uh, you know, uh, frequently asked question site where, you know, where can I walk my dog on a leash? What are the rules? Because if you do dogs leashes, it takes you a really long time to find out what the rules might be. And you don't want to know for each thing. So I'm just thinking these are, there are other questions that come in like this. If there's something we could post, so I could say, if you go here, here's the rules. So you as the resident could say, excuse me, but um, you're really not supposed to do this. You know, so we would be, nicely saying something where we we or the person felt on firm ground um yeah yeah that sounds good i'm sure that would be pretty easy to do kathy is get something very specific to bullet points about here's what here's where you can go what you can do and what you need to do and we can work with brianna on getting that accomplished any other questions on animal welfare none uh, since you guys uh, asked all of my leash law questions so I don't have to ask any uh, go into the police budget itself sounds good um, our mission statement has not changed over the last few years and that's something that we'll be working on for an upgrade this summer. So I'll transition right into recent accomplishments and challenges um, on page 111. Um, and moving with recent accomplishments. So I think everybody's probably by now aware of the um, COVID ambassador program and way back at the beginning of COVID when we were having discussions with Julie Fetterman in the health department about how best to respond to citizens' concerns and, and or complaints. Uh, I think we all felt it would be best that um, uniformed police officers weren't um, put with the task of doing that. Um, if it just advised educating people about um, wearing masks in the infancy of the COVID, I think there were a lot of different things going on and we didn't know what was gonna happen with that. So. The COVID ambassador program was born and we found a great person to run that in Kat Newman. And, you know, I worked with her, but mostly it was Bill Laramie, our neighborhood liaison officer. And they got that program up and running. It's been nothing but a complete success. And they've really kind of morphed into a bigger, uh, you know, vaccine facilitator, helping at the banks, helping at the high school. Um, I know we're talking about having them available to assist with opening a public town buildings when that happens. So it's really turned into a wonderful program and I couldn't be happier with where that's uh, really transitioned. Um, we, equip, we, we recently with our IT department improved a software upgrade for our accreditation and our scheduling so that all our policies um, online and we can review those much, much easier than we used to be able to and make changes to them. And all of our policies were recently reviewed um, we've got an accreditation renewal coming up next year, so we're working on that. And the scheduling part of it allows us now to um, reach out to officers when overtime shifts need to be filled and that sort of thing. And it's all done electronically now. So it used to involve having a supervisor calling people, and now that's all transitioning over into an electronic format. So that's really helped um, with that specific scheduling software item. Um, this past year, we uh, became one of six communities now that participate in the restorative justice program with our Northwest District Attorney's Office. And in a, I think 
I think probably most of you are aware of what it is, but the purpose of it is to really keep people out of the criminal justice system and get them into um, whatever the specific needs are they, they might have. So if it was somebody who committed a crime because of drug or alcohol problems, we will direct them to a specific area with the district attorney's office and our crisis intervention team. And if it was somebody who you know, may have been charged because of shoplifting for another reason. Um, so what we're, the purpose of it is to keep people from ending up just in a criminal process that really gets them nowhere. And um, you know, it's relatively new, um, but it's been very successful. I know that we've sent six, at least six people through that process now and we're hearing nothing but positive things about that. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. You see that we've um, expanded our outreach unit with officer Bill Laramie, who's our neighborhood liaison officer. Through donations, we were able to get a comfort dog, um, Winston. I'm sure everybody's probably met Winston by now. That was fully funded privately. Um, Bill's been doing a lot of work, both on the university campus and the elementary schools, pretty much anywhere he's been asked to. I know he went down as far as way as Bay State Medical Center to work with we were having some really tough times back during COVID and spent some time with them. So, you know, he goes all over the place. Um, we continue to do all of our work with the Craig's Door Homeless Shelter uh, when it transitioned over to First Bap, from First Baptist to the uh, UU uh, facility and also the University Motor Lodge. That's something, uh, that group that we work with on a weekly basis um, with our crisis intervention team and our DART officers uh, pretty much uh, working with them wherever they may need us. Um, resources for people who are in crisis and that sort of thing. So something that we've been very, very happy with and proud of. Um, this past year, we completed uh, one more segment of our implicit bias training um, with Romney Associates. That was department-wide. We worked with Amherst College police officers on that as well. They are interested in, in working with us um, for the times that we may need to assist them or they need to assist us. So that was um, training that the officers really got a lot of and they really enjoyed. And it was something that I wanted to do personally to find a um, non-police entity to do that kind of training for us. Typically the majority of the police training in implicit bias and restorative justice and that sort of thing is sometimes retired police officers <laughs> or that sort of thing. And I wanted a perspective from a different point of view. And I know the officers really enjoyed that training and got a lot out of it. So those are our recent accomplishments. Um, you know, key challenges and long range objectives. Um, you know, part of what we learned in our, in our, in our training was expanding and, and a, what direction do we need to go in now to facilitate um, department wide embracement of diversity and the training that went along with that. So there's been a lot of discussion internally in the, in the building with all the cops about how best to get out in the community. And I'm sure there's gonna be a lot more discussion probably coming up on the 24th about that. So I won't get too far into the weeds with that. Um, you know, recruitment, diversifying and, and retaining high quality recruits is becoming, um, it's challenging. Um, the, you know, where we are in policing in the country right now, uh, it's challenging all over and recruitment has taken a hit with that. Um, I was at a memorial service yesterday down in Springfield. I was chatting with the Springfield police chief. They had just had a recent jobs fair and they had two people come to it. Typically they'd have two to 300. So it's not just in Amherst, it's, it's, gonna, it's nationwide where People just aren't interested in the policing profession right now. So finding the right um, person for this job is gonna be a challenge in the years to come. And I don't know of a police chief that doesn't wanna diversify their agency. And, and so that's gonna become, continue to become something that we're gonna to need to work very, very hard on um, from our perspective about navigating that. Um, um, again, you know, a lot we did this past year was COVID related, whether it involved helping out our ambassadors or working over at the bank center and with our health department. Um, even though we weren't the main 
responders to citizens complaints to issues of COVID, whether it be too many people gathering, people not wearing masks. Uh, we did an awful lot of follow up with that. So if the ambassadors responded and didn't get quite the um, response that they had hoped from from the people that they were speaking to, then we would certainly do follow up. And it usually involved Bill Laramie and the sector officers. Sometimes it would be the day after, or a couple of days after to try and speak with the people about why it was important to be um, following the CDC guidelines and that sort of thing. So we did a lot of that this past year and um, that's represented in our key challenges as well. Um, status of our prior year objectives, um, you know, looking to implement and expand our SEPTEB team, which was, um, you know, award-winning and, and it really involved Bill Laramie and the sector officers and the people that we worked with at the University of Massachusetts, including Sally Lenowski and her group in the health department and in the Dean of Students office. So there was a pretty big uh, group of people who consistently work on neighborhood issues, quality of life responses and quality of life issues. And that's, I, I know that's not new to most of you on the finance committee or on the town council, but it's something that is continuous and ongoing, and it's always moving to different parts of town, um, you know, incorporating the UMass athletic teams and our Every Woman Center at the university. Um, we have an in-house civilian diversity, I mean, excuse me, domestic violence uh, person who works right in our building um, that we work closely with, and she's part of that as well. So, um, you know, Part of the things we're currently working on now, and there's a lot of information coming, not just from what's going on at the local level, but you know, the governor and the, the state legislators passed a police reform bill this past December 31st, and there are going to be a lot of changes specific to police oversight, um, you know, and training, and, and there's a certification of police officers, decertification, um, I think most of you know, I sit on the mass training committee. And so a lot of work is going into where we are going moving forward with police training and facilitating police training. But that's something that's very local as well as statewide. So uh, we continue to work on that as well. Um, we did a complete review of our policies and now we're gonna be moving into our rules and regulations over the summertime. Um, you know, I mentioned that we are an accredited police agency, so we get oversight from the state in addition to our own oversight. Um, that is reviewed every three years, and we have a new review coming up in 2022, and Captain Ting oversees that uh, with other officers in the agency, as long as Captain Bron Young as well. Um, we continue to, although it's taken a little bit of a backseat, um, training all of our schools and most of our town departments and um, Alice training, so alert lockdown and uh, provide them with safety plans and assist them at facilitating safety plans for all of our town employees, all of our school employees. Uh, we worked with most of the churches in facilitating safety plans with them as well. So that's something that we continue to do. It's accomplished, but it's also ongoing. And then again, um, continuing to move forward with President Obama's task force on 21st century policing, you know, adhering to the six pillars of the 21st century policing. A lot of what is in that we've accomplished and a lot of it we need to transition and do more with, you know, specifically about, um, you know, improving the trust and legitimacy of the agency and working with the, um, you know, potential future community out, out oversight committee that we are having discussions about and um, where exactly that's going to go. Having community uh, members review our policies, make recommendations or suggestions to that is something that we'll be working on this summer as well. So um, I'll take a breather here. Ron or Gabe, anything you wanna add that I may have missed? Um, if not, uh, I will continue to move on um, just about where our, with our budget. But anything, Ron or Gabe, you wanted to add on that I missed? I have nothing to add, Chief. It sounded good to me. Okay. Likewise, Chief. 
Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, as far as budgeting, um, you know, not much has changed. We've been, most, like most departments, level funded except for the areas of COLAs and the two positions that have been frozen. And I think everybody's familiar with that. So, you know, we were budgeted at 48, we're now budgeted at 46, um, you know, to the um, monies that are be going, to, going to go to the Crest Group and we'll be working closely with them if they wish us to. Um, so other than that, our budget is pretty much 95% um, of it being personnel. So, um, you know, when there are cuts to our budget, it's typically going to come from personnel. So um, I guess I'll stop there, Andy. If there's more information people want, I'm more than happy to generate it, but I'm guessing there's questions. Okay, uh, Sean, you had... Uh... Yeah, there's a number of questions that um, some of them the uh, chief has already touched on. So I'll probably in the sake of time, skip over those ones. Um, the first one was, how much time has been devoted to COVID? And I know the chief talked about the ambassador program. Um, the next one, maybe the chief wants to expand a little bit more, which is about the um, the CPTED team. Yep. So, you know, it's been so successful and it's been in existence now for, correct me, Gabe, if I'm wrong, but maybe eight or nine years, we've had the SEPTEB team now. Community policing through environmental design is what it is. And it originated from a lot of the call volume we were receiving for large parties and gatherings, mostly in the North Amherst neighborhood. So we incorporated a neighborhood liaison officer, Bill Laramie, whose very specific job was to work on those critical issues and deal specifically with the officers who were assigned to those neighborhoods with University of Massachusetts office, health department and, and other groups to um, really just see a reductions in those calls that we call quality of life issues. So what we wanted to do was expand on that group so that we had more than just one officer dedicated to that, one full-time officer who was Bill Laramie. So that, you know, A, we took a little bit of the workload off of Bill, but also that we could start moving into other areas of town, South Amherst, and, and quite frankly, anybody who was looking for us to work on very specific needs um, or concerns in their neighborhood. So we are looking to expand that group. Um, Bill typically works um, out of uniform um, and I think that's been beneficial as well. So um, that's kind of what that program is all about. Okay. Chief, if you don't mind me jumping in real yeah. quick, like just to give you folks uh, an example to kind of highlight what the SEPTED program is all about. Um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a mechanism for problem oriented policing. What I mean by that is, so for example, um, on Hobart Lane, that's a particularly uh, it's a hot spot for large scale college parties. And, you know, in the past years, our, our way of trying to deal with that is, you know, making arrests and just monitoring the parties to make sure it doesn't get out of hand. However, we were trying to figure out solutions of how to try and eliminate that as a hot spot. Um, so our department, our sector officers, along with our uh, outreach got together with the landlords in that area to try and brainstorm through the concepts of uh, SEPTED. And they decided to grow natural barriers in the specific uh, common areas where the college kids like to gather. And once all of that growth came in, it kind of eliminated that, eliminated that particular area as an attraction. And since then, Hobart Lane has really not been uh, all that attractive for college kids to gather anymore. So, you know, that's just one example. Another example is uh, trying to figure out areas that are more dangerous for traffic and pedestrians and where there, there might be, uh, it might benefit some more lighting. So a lot of times we'll get the DPW involved in, in other agencies to try and figure out, you know, through environmental design, how can we improve whatever the problem it is? Thank you. So the next question was about how many um, positions there are on staff. And I think the, the chief noted that there were four vacancies currently um, of which two are the ones that have been shifted to the um, social services community, or community responder program. Um, the next question was, um, so the question relates to the personnel budget and it was 
taking the FY21 budget and dividing it by 50 positions, the personnel budget, and then taking the FY22 budget and dividing it by 48 positions to get a sense of sort of what the cost per position change was. And so it was about 4.8%. Um, so that personnel line includes a number of sort of sub accounts. So there's a, a regular wage account, there's a um, educational incentives, longevity over time, there's a number of sub accounts. Um, so when we were unpacking the change, we actually did uncover a, a mistake in how the educational incentive piece was calculated. Um, it's gonna reduce the budget by about 40,000. And it's something that I have to talk to the town manager about in a little bit, because we actually just found it the other day. Um, but we'll report back to the committee about that later on when we decide where it's going to go. Um, but it's going to actually reduce the police department's budget by another 40000 And so that's one benefit of this review process and, and these detailed questions is that it's another check on our numbers. Um, but it was not in the wages section. It was in this educational benefit and some of these other types of wages. Um, there was a question also related to overtime, whether there was any change in the overtime account. And so overtime did not change the budget from FY21 to FY22. And then there was another question about whether the rate of increase per person is expected to continue. So again, once we fix that mistake and we, and we take that out, the rate of increase is actually much lower. Um, it's closer to between three and 4%. Um, and sort of like dispatch in other areas, it really depends on how many staff are getting steps and how many staff are getting colas as to what percentage increase it is. Um, and there's other changes like educational incentives and longevity that can also affect that year to year increase. The next section, Kathy, do you have a, I guess Kathy has a question. If you have a question on that specific group of questions, maybe we should stop now and then we can go to the next set. I just, um... Sean, thank you for going back in and unpacking it. So I, I had a general question, um, and I know you've got it internally. When I'm looking at the total amount, how much percentage-wise is overtime? And does that fluctuate a lot year to year? Because I um, And it's partly linked to what this last year has been like. You've been doing mm -hmm. some policing that was not what you would normally do. So it's involved with COVID. Mm -hmm. But then when I look at the calls, uh, uh, motor vehicle violations, there were some that were way down from the past. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. of that is things were way down because there were fewer cars on the road. So I didn't know how much I had, I have no sense because the budget doesn't say is um, when I look at the total is 10% of it over time? Is more of it over time? Does that vary year to year? And do you anticipate more of it next year? So if you're at a, a smaller staff size, um, does that mean the budget stays up because overtime has to go up more people? Right. So that was my question of overtime. I can't see it in the budget book. Yeah. So if, you, if you're just looking at general fund, it's less than 10%. But I think what I want to do is um, unpack that question more with Sonia after, and we can get that information back to the committee um, because there's some stuff that's paid outside of the general fund, um, which we would want to factor in as well to sort of the overall numbers. But within the general fund, it's under 10% and we can get you more details on that. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and is, are you, when you project next year with a slimmer staff, does that, do you, include that, that you think the people who are currently in, assuming you fill the vacancies, are gonna be working more overtime or do you, um, does it, that's my question. Yeah, so we didn't change it. Um, you know, I think there's a little bit of uncertainty about what next year is gonna look like on that front. Um, so we did not change, um, we didn't change the, the overtime at all. Um, it's, it stayed flat from FY21's budget to FY22. Okay. Um, and there's there's overtime, sort of regular overtime. There's overtime for training. Um, there's court time. None of those accounts were changed um, for next year. Again, I, I just in terms of the budgeting, um, this will show a little bit of ignorance. So, if you turn out to be wrong, is that the manager then making it all work? So money flows over, to, and and so you see that you were under budgeted because of this, or or flip size that you were over budgeted because you needed less. How does that work in the town town manager discretion mm -hmm. to move move across to different departments? Um, right. So um, 
so we can shift money within the budget. If we were, um, if we found out we needed more money, that happens. You know, that's not uncommon. We sort of work within departments to figure out where their savings. Um, in a situation like this, where we're still, you know, the budget hasn't been voted, um, we're still going through this review process. I think we'll probably want to come back to you with more information about where we think that money would shift to. Um, you know, the, in this year's budget, we did have sort of a one-time savings related to the premium holiday. So we know that that was built into our employee benefits um, budget. Um, and so we took that reduction because the, our revenues are not where they normally would be right now. Um, but that's sort of a one-time savings that in future years we'll have to address. Um, but that being said, again, I want to talk with um, the town manager more and we'll come back to finance committee and, and let you know the thoughts on where that would go. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions on that? I, we have some more questions on service levels and other things, but if, um, if there's more personnel related questions, we can take those. Dorothy and Bernie and Pat yeah. all have their hands up. I'm gonna pause and let's see what they have to say and then see if you can eliminate questions if they're duplicated or respond. Uh, Dorothy? My question is not asked as well as Kathy's, but it's related. In some police departments, um, overtime gets out of control. Um, and so this past year, we, you did not fill two positions, but overtime perhaps did not get out of control because of the craziness of the situation and there was less things going on, fewer car situations. But when life gets back to normal, will the loss of those two positions increase overtime? Thanks, Dorothy. Um, it might, but I can tell you this, it, Ron, Gabe, and I, we look at the budget almost on a weekly ba basis where we would bother Kim Lippman consistently because I was just taught when I became chief that you have to follow the budget and you can't go over and that's the rules. So we try and abide by that. And if we have to run short at certain times, and not fill shifts, and that's what we've done in the past when our overtime budget has been getting close. Now, I can tell you, Ron, Game, and I are pretty concerned about the fall because we know UMass is coming back in its entirety, at least that's what we're being told. Um, the, what we anticipate is we're going to have to move two bodies with the two that we've lost. Um, so, you know, we had an officer assigned to the district attorney's office. Uh, who would assist with issues of drug and alcohol abuse and those sort of things. Uh, he's being moved back to patrol. Um, and we're pretty sure we're not going to be able to fund the, what we call the community outreach officer in the downtown center district. So we have an officer who is specifically designed to downtown and he's going to have to go back to a regular patrol shift. So those are the two moves we're going to have to make to kind of fill in those two slots that we've missed. So, but yes, we, we anticipate the fall is going to be pretty busy. Just everybody coming back out of the COVID, you know, I think the students are going to be excited to be out and about again. So we're a little concerned. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Bernie. Yeah, my question um, is pretty much along the lines of, of, uh, of Dorothy's because my experience with police budgets or um, trying to calculate over time, it's always a best guess situation because you can't predict when something horrible is gonna happen. Um, so I would ask, and maybe we can take this up in a future discussion, um, you know, looking at those service levels and the, uh, the numbers of, of calls and officers involved, where would the chief expect um, that with a community resource person or community the CREST program in place, at least in the small part, where would those service levels likely drop? And would that drop in service levels offset some of the, uh, some of the loss of personnel and the need for overtime? Um, thanks, Bernie. Um, you know, I don't know yet. Um, we know we, in the discussions I've had with the community safety working group and the town manager and the team that we're kind of putting together, um, there's a whole, a lot of work about what's the responses are going to responsibilities for that group is going to be as far as calls and there's going to be a lot of discussions about it. Um, you know, if, if we're looking at 
other entities that have already established um, civilian response teams, that sort of thing, whether it's the CAHOOTS program in Oregon or the STARS program in Denver. You know, if we follow those trends, they can eat up about 10% of calls in a very specific category. So not necessarily 10% of calls overall, but, you know, we have somewhere in the vicinity of 370 mental, medical mental calls. So if they could get 20% of those, that would be a good thing. Um, you know, and, and again, these are discussions we just really started to have about what potentially those press members might be able to respond to. Is, you know, well, yeah, looking, looking at the medical mental calls and tell me if I'm getting too far off base, Andy, um, that's only about 2% of your, your total workload. If you look at the service levels chart right. that you provided, um, you know, so it's would be a concern of mine. I mean, the other thing looking at, at this was the uh, roughly a third of your calls require uh, two officers or more to uh, to respond to them. And then the other challenge that, that gets mixed into this is training. And you can't necessarily have, you have to replace people that you have off of training most of the time, I would think. So it's a complicated situation. It is. Um, the good thing is we typically know ahead of time um, about the mandates that come from the state about, okay, here's, here's the 40 hours of mandated training that every police officer has to go to. So we kind of know what that is ahead of time. And we can calculate relatively accurately how much that's going to cost us. Um, so that's kind of easy to do, but then we have additional trainings that we need to do. For instance, our crisis intervention team members will need to be going to the very specific trainings related to that. And our drug alcohol response team guys and need to have their very specific trainings and that sort of thing. So it's something we have a pretty good grasp on, but it does fluctuate from time to time. There's no question about it. Thank you. Yep. So the um, the rest of the questions, I think I some of them are just sort of individual details about how much we collected in a certain fine or um, so those we might, I can just send out to the group after. And then there's one that's probably another one that we'd want to wait um, until the, the, the community responder program is um, discussed. So I, I think that's pretty much it for the questions that were submitted. But again, I'll send these out with the responses um, uh, after the meeting. Anything else? Bernie, do, uh, do you have anything else? And I, I see Bob's hand just went up. Bernie, your hand was may have been up for earlier. Okay, Bob? Yeah, I, I just have a comment and, and it, it's regarding Alice training. I think, you know, if and when the committee uh, and other town committees get back into meeting in person, I think we all should go through Alice training because situations can happen. You know, town hall isn't locked. So I think we just put that as a future thing. The, uh, the town council is on our to-do list for that when we return to rel relatively normal. So Great. you are interested in that. Excellent. You learn? Yeah, two things. Uh, I actually would like to know the nature of the question that was delayed because of Pat's comment. And I also would like to add, add that we post the answers to the additional questions, not just send them to the committee. Yeah, so I can read. So uh, one question was uh, future training needs for social services, work with non, um, non, I think police community safety. So I think it's about the collaboration between police and, and the community responder program. Um, and then there was another one that's sort of related um, that was sort of touched upon with the medical mental, which is what percentage of calls do not need um, police presence. Um, I don't have specific answers to that only because I, we, we're not there yet. Um, you know, so I don't know the entire number of calls that you know, we'll be able to facilitate over to the Crest group. Um, 
Uh, I'm sorry, I, Sean and, and, and Kathy and Lynn, I don't have a question with those yet. I mean, I know I've made a number of statements about where we would like it to be from the, from the police department side. You know, we're welcome. We, we welcome the potential to not have to respond to some of those calls. Um, we know they're not all going to you know, go away from our police responsibility, but, um, you know, I guess we'll find out. Uh, and I also think it's probably going to be one of those situations where it'll change from year to year. Um, you know, they're going to find out that certain calls they maybe thought they could respond to, they couldn't respond to, and maybe there's other calls that we can direct in their direction as well, put in their direction as well. So I think it's going to be kind of a like living document type thing in the beginning, at least. Thank you. Thanks. Mike, can you can I, have... Sorry, can I just put, put in for one second regarding the medical mental calls? Um, this kind of goes back to the, when people have nobody else to call, they call 911. And oftentimes some of our um, population, they just want to talk to somebody in person. And those would be the type of calls that we might be able to triage out and not have to send an officer. They, they're not requesting an ambulance. They're not actually requesting an officer, but they want to speak to somebody in person and Oftentimes, the officer was the only option we have. So um, I don't want an answer to this question today. I'm just going to um, say what it is, what's been on my mind, and uh, but I really think it should wait until later in a subsequent meeting, and that is uh, of the calls that are likely to stay with the police department. Um, are those likely to be calls that require two officer responses and uh, what does that going to spin out to in staffing needs but um, I don't want to get into that today but it is a subject that I would like to get into at a future time. Um, so I'm going to add, recognize Kathy, and then what I'm going to do is um, uh, make her uh, start recognizing people from the attendee list who have uh, comments, questions. So Kathy. Okay, I, you know, Lynn's request to get the questions posted. These are things I submitted because I was doing police. Um, and I have the same, I know Lynn, you might have had some that we did on elementary school that got answered. But I think, um, Sean, last year you posted questions asked with some answers underneath it, which was a good use of time to not do it. And so um, I'm overlapping in some of what Andy is asking and some of it is moving over to Crest, but at least all of us, because our instructions were not to send them to the whole committee, but to send them through Sean. Um, so those of you who didn't see it, um, it I, I, I'm not sure maybe next year we could think of, there's no particular reason not to share those questions in advance. So as other people are looking at the budget, they can think of what else they might have. Um, last year, Bob and I did um, the uh, enterprise funds and DPW together, but we looked at each other, so we weren't sending overlap, you know, we were differentiating, but, but I think it's really useful that you think someone has looked at it. So just on to the one other piece, when we're moving to the 27th conversation, and I know these, some of these are not answerable. So he just asked, which require now two police officers? My thought is if we think into the future, with these unanswerable questions, would there ever be a point whether there is a police officer there for some potential risk, but the person, the primary person would be the community, the crest person, you know, so that there's, it's a team response in an, is it in an unmarked car, you know, or whatever, but trying to think of what are some creative, if we have a much more robust and differentiated way of safety, um, how can we handle those? And I don't expect an answer. It's me thinking of what might be possible when we're thinking creatively about a different future. So just again, for the 27th more. Sure. Um, and I would just add, Kathy, I agree with you. Um, you know, I think there's going to be uh, a need for us to be intertwined us in the Kretz group, because there certainly are going to be times where they may get to something and be like, hey, this is out of, this isn't part of what we do. 
And I think there will be times when a police officer responds and says, hey, the Crest people should be here. So I think you'll see that, yes, happen frequently. Thank you. Okay. So with that, I want to I'm going to switch over and um, anyone who's in the attendee group who wants to be recognized, um, please raise your hand. I'm uh, right now seeing only one hand up. And uh, so I'd ask Athena to bring in uh, Russ Vernon Jones. Russ? And I... uh, yes, uh, as you probably know, I'm a member of the Community Safety Working Group. Uh, and I've been listening to your discussions today and I, I don't wanna jump the gun or try to start the discussion early, um, but I did wanna correct one misimpression, what might've been a misimpression. Uh, but first I wanna say that Chief Livingstone has been very generous with his time and sharing information with our group and very open as you just heard to the, the idea of collaboration between the Crest Program and the Amherst Police Department. Um, we've not had as much time to share with him uh, our vision of what the CREST program will be. Um, but I just wanted to say that across the country, the, uh, most of these programs are handling between 25% uh, and 30, or 20% and 35% of calls that police have had. Uh, and CAHOOTS is um, at least twice what was quoted. It's, it's at least 20%. Um, so I, I just didn't want people to spend the two weeks with that misimpression. Um, and, but we'll, we'll talk more, uh, in a couple of weeks when the, the working group comes to be, to discuss this with you. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you, Russ. So, um, I see, uh, Brianna Owen, uh, can we, can we bring Brianna in? Hi everyone, thank you for having me. Um, I just wanted to clarify one thing that kind of seemed to be misunderstood in the beginning of the meeting. CRESS was specifically designed to be an alternative public safety service. The implementation of this program will not serve its intended purpose if it is not an alternative to policing. And I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. And um, I'm looking um, forward to a complete presentation on the 27th uh, so that uh, council has an opportunity to um, get, get a complete understanding of what is being proposed and what the vision of the, the discussion of the community services working group is. So thank you for bringing that to us. Um, and uh, Seeing nobody else from the um, attendee list who's asked to be recognized, I'll go back to the committee to see if there are any uh, final follow-up questions that, uh, or comments from the committee itself. See, uh, Kathy, you... Yeah. I, yeah, Andy, I have one not about today's uh, uh, sp focused, but um, one more generally when we would be meeting to discuss it. And it may be when we, the capital budget um, has assumptions about the large building projects, so not the library, but the others. Do we have a specific day when we will be talking about the, um, all of that? Because that originally came from a proposed way of staff of being able to finance or all these, but we've never had a discussion and JCPC specifically did not talk about that at all. We just looked at those line items and it, it goes with issuing debt and then debt service in the future. So it has an impact on operating budgets or an impact on what else we can do. So I'm just looking for when that discussion will happen. Um, that's question number one. And I think Sean asked me, answered my other question, but we heard with schools that they've got, once we council votes on a budget, 
the schools have some flexibility to move money around to the extent it, they need more in one error. So they've got a cap. Did, does that do, does the town manager within the departments that he is overseeing, we, we're setting budgets or we're talking about budgets. Is there that same flexibility more or less, and do most, what I heard, I think you say, Chief Lillian Stone, is that you live with the budget that you were given. You know, So yes, you can come back. So everyone kind of looks at it. So those are my two questions, just on how does the second part work, but also do we have a specific day? And if we do, I want to, I think we should post it as a full council meeting, Lynn. Um, so it's the capital budget, but also these other pieces, because we're in effect, endorsing a particular approach if we're endorsing that the five-year budget and the next year budget um, with fire and police, fire and um, DBW in it. So that was my question on the first part. Yeah, Sean, why don't you respond to that quickly? I wanted to try and stick with public safety uh, and uh, get back to the logistics of the committee more at the conclusion because otherwise it's unfair to our fire department staff who are also waiting. Um, yeah, I can answer those really quick. Um, the, the capital improvement program, so we already did sort of discuss it. The first, um, I think our first meeting in May, we did a, a budget overview and then we did the capital improvement program. Um, however, I imagine it can be discussed more um, before the finance committee does its report. And also uh, I think there's a forum um, scheduled in June where it can be dis discussed more. And then obviously if the finance committee wants to schedule additional time to get into more detail into the capital improvement program, we can. Um, and then the second piece, um, yeah, yes, the town manager can shift between departments, although I'll say almost none of that happens since I've been here. There's very little shifting between departments. Departments stick to their budgets. Um, it's uh, all the departments are very good at, you know, what their budget is that's voted for the year operating within that budget. And it's really if there's an emergency or something along those lines where, where it might happen. Um, Thank you. Yeah, in, in our old form of government, just so you uh, to remind everybody, um, we were budgeting to functional areas so that public safety would be one functional area. And if public safety, uh, if the money needed to be moved around within those segments, uh, the town manager did not have to come back to the uh, finance committee and town meeting. Uh, but if there was, a, uh, and I think that under our new form of government, there's even a greater degree of flexibility to that. Uh, but we can talk about that another time. Um, so I think that's it then, unless anybody has any last questions, I'm looking around. Uh, Pat, I know you've been, had your hand up for a while and then took it down. My question was covered uh, by Bernie when I had it up. Okay, great. So, uh, Chief Livingstone and uh, everybody else from the police department uh, and uh, Captain King, uh, Mr. Curtin, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Thank you. We really, very, appreciate, very. It. Thank you. Uh, we thank really you. appreciate that this has been a very difficult year in many different respects and we uh, really thank you for what you've done for our community through this very tough year so thank, thank you Andy and thank you to everybody appreciate it and I see that uh, we have uh, Chief Nelson here and uh, I think I saw Good afternoon. Yeah, it's Hi. it's an afternoon. Good afternoon. So I'll leave it to you and then uh, say hi to Lindsay too. I think uh, Assistant Chief uh, Olm Olmstead should be, be here as well, correct? When, Lindsay, is, is he here? Uh, he doesn't appear to me. I'll give him a buzz on the phone. I thought he was okay. going to sign on, but you can. Okay. Started okay. also coming up too. Okay. All right. Good. Thanks. All right. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, 
just want to say hi. I'm on vacation too, by the way. <laughs> but it's 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 nice. It's nice. It's a little, little nicer where I I, I am. So anyway, so uh, you know nothing. You know no no great great over over opening or speech or, or whatever. You know we're you know this 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 has been an exceptional exceptional year I think for every, 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 everyone and we're no 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 exception. We've been you know trying still still trying to trying to deliver. You know, top top notch service, service uh, with, in spite of the, uh, the conditions we've been been in for the last year and a half now. It seems you know the uh, with, with with the pan, pan, pan pandemic, it's 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 brought some uh, pressures upon us. But I think we've been able to you know meet meet those uh, challenge 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 challenges and rise rise above 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 them, and you'll see as we go go along. But uh, uh, again, it, it's it's been been a challenge 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 for us. Uh, we've you know we've you know we've you've heard 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 about about our staff staffing is 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 issues uh, again. But uh, we've we've had you know for over, over a little bit bit now we've had some issues with uh, folks that 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 are out long long term. Uh, and uh, and uh, we've had a little bit of a baby baby boom again, you know. So 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 you combine those with you know, uh, and it makes it makes 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 for a challenge, challenging challenging uh, process for 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 us. But again, I think we've done a lot to meet meet that and rise rise, rise above above that it, it to as I said uh, to perform our core to do duty, which is. Is which is to perform, which is to uh, give give uh, give good good public public, public uh, safety protection for the town. So, um, with that, I think I think I, I just over open it up to the panel. From the panel, panel. I know I know there 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 are a few questions. I think there there's uh, there's there are assistant chief. So, but yeah. So feel free to. You want me just to run through um, the yeah, questions, yeah. Chief Nelson? Yeah, okay. yeah, sure. That's it. that's fine. Bill. That's fine. The first, um, the first couple are actually more um, Sonia and, and myself uh, right. questions, um, and, and Pat submitted these about. Um, so the first one's the ambulance fund, and the increase from the the amount of ambulance funds to support the budget in FY twenty one to FY twenty two. It's an increase, I think, of about seven point four percent. So that number was in. It was decreased quite a bit in FY21 um, because of COVID. And I think it was also because of the Hadley um, contract. So it was sort of a double whammy for FY21 that reduced that number. Um, as we look forward to FY22, we anticipate that to start to recover um, with the colleges and colleges and universities coming back in full. Um, we think the lull and in, in call volume will start to come back. And the other thing is that fees were increased. The um, the ambulance fees were increased. And so we'll start to see what that actually looks like. That number is gonna be a little bit of a, a moving target for the next couple of years as we see how the fee increases play out. And then also, um, again, as the, as the students come back, how that, that number sort of stabilizes. Um, so that's why that increased so much for FY22 and, and it could continue to increase. Um, Sonia will correct me if I'm wrong, as she always does, on uh, the ambulance fund, which is a receipt reserve for appropriation fund. And so the way that works is we can only budget the amount of money that we actually have at the time when the budget is voted. Um, and so Sonia, we've made the $2 million as of right now um, for FY22's budget, right? Correct. Okay. And so in addition to the amount of money that supports the general fund budget, we also try to build up a balance in that fund to pay for some capital expenditures as well. So the last ambulance that we purchased um, the, earlier in this fiscal year, that was purchased out of the ambulance fund. And I don't know if um, Chief Nelson has an update on when, we, when that ambulance is supposed to arrive. Right, 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 right now we're look, look, looking at mid to late July for the, okay. uh, the new, the new, the new. Okay, great. Um, so that's the question on the ambulance fund. And then there was just a question just following up on that specific one about um, how the ambulance funds are used. So they generally support the, the fire EMS staffing um, in the budget. There is some that goes to support, um, there's some software related to the insurance billing that it also supports, but we can provide a breakdown, a more detailed breakdown of that. I can do that right now if you want. Yeah, go ahead, Sonia. 
So there's about 57,000 that we goes to the general fund to um, for our collection. We're a third party collection now. So we have Constar do the collections on that. And that's about, we budget an estimated amount of what the fee is gonna be for that collection. And the $10,000 for the ESO software, and that's, that's all that comes out of there now towards the general fund. It used to be a person, a part of a person in the collector's office when the billing was in-house, but it's no longer in-house. And so the rest is for the fire EMS staff in or the fire EMS department, right? Okay. There's like 1.9 something million that's for fire staffing. Right. So then the next question that's also sort of us is about um, the CARES money that funded for temporary positions. So it funded so those four temporary positions were funded through the end of December and then they stopped and the reason why they stopped is at that time we thought cares was um, going to end at the end of December and we got received really late notice um, in the last week or two of December that the um, cares program was going to be extended um, and so it, you know chief Nelson correct me if I'm wrong on this I believe those positions have been brought back mostly to fill in for um, leaves and and things of that nature and then we're anticipating keeping them on from CARES funding as the colleges and university return. Uh, but those, because they're funded from CARES, if the funding comes from CARES, it has to be related to CARES. So we're gonna have to do an evaluation in the fall um, to see it, you know, what we're, we're anticipating there could be a bump and there could be a need for additional EMS staffing when all the college students come back. Um, but we'll have to do an evaluation in the fall to see what that looks like. Yeah, you're, you're right, we're using, we brought, brought back temps right, right, right now. Uh, we. We've got to cut a few folks that that are out long long term uh, in, uh, on on the injured list. And then the so the next question um, I'll pass off to probably um, Chief Stromgren about the equipment and the vehicles. Um, so the first question is about the. Uh, 32 year old ladder truck and the the pressures of maintenance and serviceability and reliability. Sure. Yeah, the uh, ladder truck is at this point 33 years old. It's a 1988. And I just learned uh, yesterday, actually, that it's the second oldest ladder truck in the state of Massachusetts. And after researching, if that's true, um, I found that the Wareham is the fire department that has the oldest, and they just voted to replace it. Um, so pretty soon here, we'll have the oldest in the state. Um, but theirs is actually what we call a straight stick. It's a much smaller truck. Uh, we are looking to replace our ladder platform, which is really a different piece of equipment, much heavier duty, uh, usable, versatile piece of equipment. So we actually already have the oldest ladder platform in the state, which is not a distinction uh, we like to have. Um, the issue with its age is a uh, multifold. You know, any vehicle, obviously, the older it gets, the uh, more maintenance intensive. It's going to be that applies to both the ladder truck, the ambulances, the fire trucks. You know, the one thing that the upside on a ladder truck is we're not running it every day the way we are ambulances and fire trucks. So it's very low mileage. But um, when you start to get 30 years plus, obviously, that doesn't isn't particularly relevant anymore either. You know, it's body corrosion and, uh, and just dated uh, equipment. So when a truck gets that old, what we find is an increase in repairs. And then doing those repairs both take much longer to accomplish and are much more expensive because the parts become much harder to obtain. So there's weeks delays at the uh, vendor to uh, get the parts and then to get them in. Um, so I, what, what that translates into is downtime, you know, the cost of a repair. And this really carries over, Sean, I think, into what's the next question, which is just the overall ambulance, you know, eight, not replacing ambulances on schedule, any vehicle. There's you know, a number of different costs when you talk about a breakdown. There's the actual cost to fix it, the parts and labor, but then there's the cost potentially to tow it. You know, We pay about $400 a tow to move a vehicle uh, 20 miles, that's the going rate. Or we have to pay individuals overtime to drive it somewhere if it's drivable. Then there's the cost, you know, certainly of the admin time to arrange for all those repairs, uh, purchase orders, et cetera. And then the, the, the cost of um, loss of use, you know, that's a very real cost is not having in the case our one ladder truck or in the case of an ambulance, one or two ambulances is not available. So you have to look at, at that. So when you look at the ladder truck back to that topic, you know, last year uh, rough off the top of my head, that was at a service about three months, three to four months that it was not here available. 
And in fact, right now it is not here available. It's at the uh, repair shop. So when you get to be a truck that old, we're talking, you know, months that it's not available 25% or more of the year. So that's a very real concern as well as the actual cost of fixing it. And right now on that particular truck, the um, two components of it, the generator, the onboard generator to provide lighting and other things is uh, out of service and unrepairable. They can't get the parts for it. And likewise with the breathing air system that's out of service and uh, not cost effective to repair. So it's already operating below its uh, full capacity even when it is here in service. The last part of those questions were, wouldn't it be cheaper in, in over this range of costs to replace it with a new truck? What and why hasn't something like that been budgeted? I mean, I can only speak to half of that, which is, you know, yes, we've had it on our, our five-year plan now for about five years. We've, we've put it in the budget capital request the last three years um, because we do feel that both for cost and reliability and usefulness, it is time to replace it in terms of why it hasn't been funded. I'll to defer that to Sean or one of the others. Yeah, um, I know it's on the radar for the Joint Capital Planning Committee and, and for us in terms of thinking about capital. Um, uh, I know, uh, Chief Stromgren, you did some research into sort of the history of the of the ladder truck and how the town came to um, get it in the first place. I don't know if you wanted to share some of that because I think it's interesting. It might be something we have to consider going forward. Yeah, I mean, I think, unfortunately, what I found in my research is always what I was sort of was afraid was an urban myth was that uh, Amherst College had paid for part or all of it the last time in 1988 um, in picking the brains of uh, people that were here back then, um, former chiefs and assistant chiefs. Um, what I found is that was not the case. I guess that was discussed, but um, that didn't actually occur. The town actually did buy that truck outright. I guess if you go back to the previous ladder truck, which was a 1953, um, there was some kind of funding obtained, I think from the university at the time, but that's so far back now that I really can't give you any details. So unfortunately, even though a lot of us had in our head that there had been some collaboration uh, 33 years ago, it would appear that that was discussed um, as a potential, but that never came to be. So then uh, the next grouping of questions is on community paramedicine. And it is a, the first one is what would be some of the staffing and financial impacts in an EM, EMS transition to community paramedicine be? I'm going to so, have, uh, going to have the assistant chief on, on, on the handle hand it. So the community paramedicine would not take away uh, necessarily a lot from the current 911 emergency ambulance system we have. It would add to it. It wouldn't be a, a point where we would take people from shift because we don't have enough people that are covering the ambulances that we have now. We would be looking to have a standalone person uh, or persons work doing community paramedicine. And the umbrella for community paramedicine is pretty broad based on your area. So for example, a community paramedic in Alaska can do stitches and that's not necessarily a you know very well used uh, skill in you know western Massachusetts but the areas that we really look to concentrate on would be more along the lines of anything from working with folks with homelessness mental health um, chronic disease uh, and working with primary care doctors to try to do things to help really send less people to the hospital and that decreases costs for not only the community the patient insurance um, and make can make a big difference uh, in the big, big picture. The hard part about community paramedicine is the financing and then getting paid for the services that we might provide. So if we help folks with home safety, uh, take care of somebody who has a just received a, a surgery and then we do some follow up so they don't have to go back to the emergency department. Um, the limitations on that right now is we would be basically billing probably a Medicare rate, um, which is a lower level rate in the insurance world uh, to get reimbursed for the services we provide. So it would be something we would be adding to the system to try to make the overall health of the community better. Um, but we're so short staffed on the emergency side, it wouldn't, we wouldn't see a, a change out from that group. 
And then the, um, the last question we have is, what if any financial impact uh, would compliance with the new OSHA regulations, uh, would there be from the new OSHA regulations? Or are well, we already living it? Well, <laughs> no, not, not that. One, one, one of the good, good things about, about these new regs is that the state is a little, state of course is a little looking for compliance. But at the same same time, they're not they're not going to come come through with 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 the bat and for and you know and and, and hit and hit hit folks about about the head, getting them to 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 comply. The state won't want to work 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 with you know, municipal pal 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 or pal. So so the, so for us, it's a case case of just make make making our work area area area, area safe. Uh, we're you know we're we're in a, in a good good place through a good part part or part of the town, but you know for instance uh, since central head 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 headquarters there's a lot that would need to be done need, need yeah well, that that would have 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 to be done to bring it in into in, into compliance the best the be, best way to bring bring the, the building in, into the compliance would would be to replace it with a new a new a new, a new build a new building so but there there are there are there there will will be a ten ten and then cost, but not, but uh, but not not costs that would be in an or or an ordinance. And in and in 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 the end, I guess you know, you'd have have to ask at what at what price prices and what for employees say 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 safety. But that be, being be, being said uh, again, uh, I don't believe that 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 the cost would be of then in or in order to fashion to bring us into compliance. Hey, Sean. Yes. Sean. Can I add one other thing about the community paramedics? And I kind of paused wondering if anybody was going to ask any questions. Our first really big, uh, you know, dip into community paramedics that we've started with is, is really been the COVID vaccination program. So we've been heavily involved with the vaccination clinics since they started, uh, whether it's working with Emma and Jen, you know, uh, sort of managing and running those or the number of medics that have worked at the clinics to help give shots and the impact we've had doing the homebound program. Uh, and really, it's been a really good collaborative effort with public health and the uh, volunteers and the nurses from the school. So the vaccination clinic was kind of our one big uh, jump into this, but we did it other than myself uh, with folks that were off duty. So just to sort of transition back to that question, like how would that impact? It would, it would probably be something that would be outside the normal staffing of the shift. Thank you for doing it and also for that information. Yeah, I too want to thank you for uh, doing that uh, participation and all that you did to make those uh, uh, vaccination clinics so successful. Sean, was there anything else? Um, the only thing I'll add, um, just building off what Chief Nelson mentioned, is um, it, it's sort of on the capital side of things, but there is a, um, a, a borrowing authorization to advance the design work for a new fire station. That's part of the FY22 request. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind, sort of the whole fire package that there's a, as a request for funding to move that project forward. Well, I have a couple of questions. Um, there, were, yeah. there, was, there was one more question and it was about uh, what's led to 125, what changes in practice have led to 125% increase in fire calls? Oh yeah, that one got cut off. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> all right. Well, for first, first off, the one twenty five percent in 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 increase is in our uh, what what we call our res, 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 rescue type type calls, and with that did that made an in an in, in, in increase in total 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 calls of about four four fourteen percent. What 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 we 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 we've been doing uh, about for the last year now, I believe. March, March 30th of last year. Yep. Okay. All right. What do, what we've done is we got a practice where for a certain certain type type types of calls, um, either the EMS calls, we we will send uh, a fire truck fire fire truck in in addition to 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 do that. We're sending more more per per per, per personnel, and that's for uh, heart heart attack strokes, uh, the difficulty breathing. Calls where, uh, in gen, gen, general, you're going to need more, more, more hands. 
So that's that's where those, those additional additional runs runs come come from. And it's it's uh, we we do we did uh, actually Jeff 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 did a lot of re re research on on this, and it turned and it it turned it turned turns out it means that we we end end up with a better better out, out better out, outcomes for our pay, pay patients and our for, for, for personnel. You know, um, you're send, 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 sending more more help. More, uh, more, more, more hands, more eyes, more X, and more X, X expertise to 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 the scene to address address, address calls, and uh, one one of the other pretty few, few pieces of this 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 is, you know, at times you know we our folks tend tend to say, okay, look, I've got to got to be concerned about the next the next the next next call, so I'm not going to call for help, even though I may need 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 help to move to move if they pay. Patients, let's say, and then and the, but they're they're think they think about well uh, we we may have to go some somewhere else and that that type type of thing and we pushed you know at the most important call you're on is the call you're on so which which means that if you need need help call for for help if you need need help to move move a pay pay to your patient you don't you don't you don't need need to blow blow out your back you know to move to move the patient, we will get, you know, their, 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 their self help out, 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 out there. And the other piece of this is too, on those high acuity, acuity calls, you know, most, most, most of our per personnel are paramedics. Once, once they, they, you know, you, you get more of the, of that ex expertise on scene, you have, uh, again, you're going to go, you're going to move towards a better out, out, outcome for your for your patient because you've got more folks more high 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 highly trained folks that are part 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 of this in the in, in incident so that so that's you know yes we're, we're, run, we're, we're run, running more 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 calls for those because because of that but in the end it, it it's about bringing about a better out, outcome for a pay pay I'm going to step away for a minute, but I'm going to turn it over to uh, the committee vice chair, Kathy, because she has her hand up and is going to use the time to ask her questions anyway. So I'll be right back. You're muted, Kathy. I'm temporarily vice chair promoted to chairness, um, and I'll ask. I had two questions. I'll stay with the capital side. I noticed under upcoming objectives, uh, repair and maintenance plan for the North Station. Uh, in I sit on the capital uh, planning side and in my memory, there weren't any big requests for the North Station. So is most of what um, you foresee for the North Station immediate needs over the next year or several years within just a maintenance or repair budget? Or are there big ticket items that we don't know about? That's question number one. Okay. I'll let, well, I'll let Lindsay and the answer that, 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 that. There, there's, um, I'll say there's no immediate needs in terms of a critical infrastructure, like a boiler or air conditioning system, something like that. Those have been repaired in the last five years or so mostly unfortunately due to emergency procurements but they are new at this point um we definitely have some exterior uh, envelope needs that i've discussed with uh, jeremiah from the um the facilities department um the outside of north station is looking a little rough if you've seen it we have rotten flaking on all the wooden parts of the building um so he's come to look at that so I'm just throwing out rough numbers here, but you know that's something in the uh, thirty to fifty thousand dollar range, probably at this point. Um, that needs to get done. Those are one of the big ones we're aware of. Uh, he tells me that the roof is nearing end of life. Um, it's hard to believe. It seems like we just replaced it, but it's over twenty years ago. So he's concerned about that based on the type of roof. You know, that's really his area of expertise more than ours. So we are looking to him more and more to uh, assess those parts of the building where he has the knowledge beyond us. Um, certainly inside there will be things like uh, carpeting and other interior renovations that are gonna need to be done in the upcoming years, but there's not a singular um, you know, item that we're aware of that's gonna have to be replaced. And, and Kathy, can I add to that real quick? Um, one of the changes we made this year 
um, in addition to what uh, was just said about Jeremiah, our facilities manager, taking more um, more of an active role in maintaining the fire stations. Um, we also included, you know, remember that interior exterior repair ongoing amount. Um, historically, that has not included the fire stations. It, it, those buildings were maintained sort of separate from that. Um, this year, we intentionally added the fire stations to the bucket of or the or the group of facilities that will be covered covered by that money. Um, so I imagine that money will help with these projects in the future um, that were just mentioned. Okay, so so roof is one potential that I don't remember seeing. So I'm just you know noting that. But um, so let me just switch to staffing. Then um, in the past you've talked about uh, staffing as uh, an issue, and um, what I can see from the overall service calls is one thing COVID did was fewer EMS calls. Um, you know not dramatic, but lower um, in the last year. So as you look forward, I think we had asked um, that the town manager work with maybe with staff to update the staffing analysis for fire since Hadley left us, you know, just on a, your, your sense of how well staffed you are for next year or for the next couple of years, because you, you have been in fact flat um, in terms of FTE. So it, I just had a, a basic question on staffing and the need for, um, Lynn and Pat will remember, we asked for sort of an assessment and an update analysis of that, not saying we're sure you're short staffed, but just an update um, and reassessment. So any thoughts on staffing? Sure. Uh, you know, with even, even, even with a lot loss of had, 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 I think we're still behind behind the eight, 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 eight ball. It's like, uh, you know, with, with, with had, 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 the water was up, was up, was up to, to our nose. Now, now without, without them, it's, it's up, it's up, it's up to, to our chin, chin now. We're still in deep, deep water here. And yes, COVID uh, reduced our calls, but that's uh, that. That's not not another way. It's 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 going to be forever. We projected, projected that when they had Hadley left, our first projection was that it it would take about five five years to get to get to get back where 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 we were when when we had 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 Hadley. After about the first year, it, it looked it looked like that projection was going to be about three 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 years. Now with COVID. COVID Covid having having you know shown 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 up, it's it it's you know it's put push it's put push that 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 out a bit. I right right now rough rough guess guess guesses two 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 to three 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 years. But again, we're already behind the curve. No matter no matter what, we're you know we we sh we, we should. Uh, I mean we 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 we've been at at this at staffing level. Level, uh, geez, uh, I'm saying I'm thinking for at least 20, 20, 20, 20 years. Uh, Lindsay, you, you can you can uh, find fine tune tune that for me, but I think it's been at least 20, 20 to twenty to twenty five years that we've been at it, at, the, at this at this level uh, level, and that and 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 that's in 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 in, in the end, we serve a we we don't serve a small small town. We serve a small city. All right. Uh, what and all the all the uh, studs, 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 studies have shown the latest one being 2017 has shown that what what we've done is we've used a rural mom model for an urban set set and that and that's the, and in in the end that won't that can't 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 be sustained sustainable in in turn in terms of service service to the public and the and and the effect on per for personnel, be it stress, burn, burn, burnout, that that type, type, type of thing. So yeah, it, it, it's a, something that needs that needs to be addressed. And uh, the town family have Andrew and I talked have have, have talk, talked about this extensively. But I mean, for, for me, it, it's been been a case where I where I've said at some some point there is there are some constituencies that are going to have 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 to be denied denied funds. In order, in order, in order to have this high type, type of public safety pro, 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 pro presence that presence that this town needs and 
deserves. So. Yeah, and I just to answer your question, Chief. It's one thing that's that's always important to keep in mind that differentiation of um, staffing versus minimum right. staffing. Right. Um, you know, if you talk about staffing, uh, we have had a small increase. Staffing is the actual number of uh, FTEs that work for the fire department. There was a small staffing increase when Chief Hoyle was here. Um, so we're talking about 15 to 20 years ago, where they got a safer grant which uh, covered the costs of uh, those firefighters for a few years and then the town ultimately picks up the cost of them. But minimum staffing, which is the number of firefighters that report to work each day that we require to be here in the building to serve the town, that is currently um, at seven during the non-academic year, eight during the academic year. Um, you know, it was, I think, uh, five in the 70s, early 80s, uh, went up to six in the 80s, and now we're at seven. So no, the, the actual minimum staffing, which really is the number we should care about the most, uh, really has not gone up. That's the number that we want to go up. Then the question becomes how many FTEs do you need to maintain that particular minimum staffing because you have to take into account vacation time, training, uh, sickness, et cetera. Obviously you need more FTEs assigned to each shift in order to maintain that minimum staffing. Otherwise your overtime becomes crazy and you just can't maintain it because you can't get people to work enough overtime. And I wanna just kind of throw in the idea that that minimum staffing today of eight and what it gets you essentially is three ambulances that are cross staffed. They, they have a spot in an engine and they are assigned to an ambulance. And that leaves two firefighters left to be the only firefighters left in town when we use all three of those ambulances, which we frequently do. And we're honestly a four ambulance community. Like every day, we should probably have four ambulances available to the community and on Friday nights, five. It's predictable, it's preventable. It happens routinely, especially when the students come back in the fall. This is not, we see this in mutual aid. We see this the number of times we draw Northampton ambulance or Belshine ambulance to our community, especially on those times. That's the service load we are. We are desiring to have one, at least one engine of three and probably four ambulances all the time. That's what our service need is. And it pushes you out towards 11 as a minimum staffing instead of eight. And ideally when we are at 13, we did those extra uh, money that we got from UMass and we're at 13, we can pretty much cover all of our needs and not have to ask for help from outside communities on a regular basis. Um, and we're able to kind of be all the places we're supposed to be. And as a captain, I you know had spent time on a Friday night driving my fire truck by myself from one call to another because all my ambulances were gone. And that was just the buffer between the next ambulance coming back into town. And that was not an unusual event in those days. So I just, um, I'm looking for other hands, but just following up, it sounds like uh, UMass needs to ante up for some of this. If the, sur the surge is predictable and the prediction of where the surge is coming from is also predictable. Um, this. Well, that, that is true, but we've, and in our, in our studies, studies, studies we've, we found that the growth, our EMS growth, has been in, been in the town of Amherst. That's where most of our growth, growth is coming, coming, coming from. And yes, we need to you know, make, make sure that, that, uh, that uh, actually all, all three, three schools pay, pay, they pay their fair share. But at the same time, most of our growth is in town. And that, and, 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 and that's, you know, and we need, we need, you know, at some, some point we, we need to do, do some, something about, 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 about this. We've talked about this. I've been, been here 11 years. We can, we, we talk, talk about, about it every, 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 every year. And for the 10 to 15, 15 years before, before that, I knew about, about this problem, problem, problem when I was a captain in, 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 in the whole Holyoke. Service in, 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 in this state. If you if you describe a a, a department depart department that, that run, runs its uh, run, runs its, uh, its its per personnel the way the way the way we 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 do we cross cross cross, cross staff we're, we're run we're run, running all over all over the place and that that type 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 of thing with the number of folks that that that, that we have on duty 
invariably folks, folks will say, oh, you must be from Amherst. It's, it's well, well known throughout the, throughout, the, throughout the state, but we haven't, we have not, you know, take, 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 taken the steps yet to address, address, address it. You know, I know, I know it comes, comes it, 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 it pretty much come, comes down, down to money. I'm, I know, I know, I know, and it does, it doesn't grow, 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 grow on trees. But at some, some point, we have, we have to take an, the, the firm, an firm, firm to step saying, okay, this is what we're going to do to address, address it, or say, we're just not going to address, address it. But we can't just keep talk, talk, talking about this. We have to do something, so, do something about it one way or the other. Thank you very, thank you very much. I'm. I see Andy is back, and Andy, um, I opened up a question about staffing needs, and that's what you were hearing. Um, yes, no, I, I'm I, turning. I, I'm turning chair back to you. Okay, uh, I do see that there's one member of the public who wishes to come. We're going to do one more round of public comment in a few minutes, so uh, I just want to acknowledge that somebody does have their hand up on the public side, the attendee side. Um, I had two questions, uh, Chief, and I don't know if, uh, if for Assistant Chief uh, Stromgrim that I'll pose them to you and you, obviously. Um, one is back to the uh, ladder truck question that was addressed earlier, and that is how many communities of um, in, in our vicinity have similar ladder trucks and um, is this um, something that, you know, what's the cost of it? And is this something that in other parts of the state or country can be shared by communities or is there really a substantial need right here that we have, that we should be having our, our own operational ladder truck? Let me take that, Chief. Yeah, you, you can start, yeah. <laughs> okay. um, so, I, I mean, the cost is, the, the, the current cost, which is based on, based on state bid is 1.4 million. So that's the cost of a new ladder truck today. Um, in terms of the, what's available in the area, um, the closest one, and just to clarify, this is what we call a ladder platform. It's a, a relatively large truck, 100 feet plus in the air capability with a platform in the end for firefighters. So you don't have to climb it up and down. It lifts you up in the air or civilians that you're rescuing. Um, there are some smaller ladders out there with no platform on the end. Um, Northampton has one, East Hampton has one. Those of course are on the other side of the river. Uh, this side of the river, we have one in South Deerfield and Ware. Those are the closest. Um, it is considered part of a regional mutual aid system in that obviously communities like Pelham, you know, smaller towns, even Hadley, Hadley has a ladder stick, but not a ladder platform. Um, larger communities such as ours typically have them. Smaller communities can't afford them um, or staff them and may, will call for them when necessary. When ours is out of service as it is right now, uh, we would be calling Northampton as our first in ladder platform. This is they call for us very often. Um, and the utility is yes, our, our community definitely, without a doubt, uh, has built. You would you could actually use it at a, at a house, a two story house. It's a very useful tool, but in particular, it gets useful for sort of your downtown businesses. Um, the misconception that we need it because of high rises at UMass is just that it's a misconception. You would not use a ladder truck of any kind at a high rise at UMass or anywhere. Uh, we fight those fires from the inside. But I'll let the chief or Jeff talk about the utility of, quite frankly, the type of construction that we're seeing in town now, as well as some of the older construction downtown is exactly what you would use uh, this type of truck for. So I'll go ahead and start then. So if you look at the downtown and how it's changed, you know, Kendrick Place, One East Pleasant Street, uh, the entire downtown as it presently existed, we're not getting to those roof access points, getting up there to fight fires or ventilate without a ladder platform or a large ladder to get up there. That's just, you can't get there from ground ladders very easily. The buildings are too big. And then the downtown construction, instead of building with block masonry concrete, we're actually building these buildings. They're wood frame, they're, they're made of wood. Trusses, engineered wood, 
Uh, they do have sprinkler systems, but they can still burn. They still have places and we still have rescue needs. As we burn, as we build, we're building up in Amherst. So if you go to North Amherst and you look at the Beacon Project and you look how large those apartments are and there's construction you know, requests to make more big buildings in Amherst, that's not gonna go away. Um, there are more dormitories that are going to be built over at UMass because that's on a short list to start uh, in the near year or two. Um, and there's not a lot of space left in Amherst. So the only place really to go is to go up. Um, and to do that, we need to have the protection to do fire and rescue and this affects services to make things nicer sometimes affects services. And this is one of those examples where it does have an effect on one of the services in town by making other parts of the community you know, a better place to live, a nicer place to live, nicer apartments, uh, nicer downtown skylines, if you like that, um, those kind of things. We need to have the ability to provide the services that we're expected to provide. And the tool to do that in this case is this ladder platform. Oh, you, you and Matt, Mitch mentioned the possible build, but we have shares sharing of oil, oil, oil truck and all and that's the type of thing. You know, when you need when you need you need that oil, oil truck you need, you need it right then, 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 then and there. Uh, share sharing some, something like that means that some 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 someone is some someone else is gonna have to have to bring bring to bring it to your in in into the or you're gonna have to have to take your personnel to take it to Someone else's, and, and, and that's just not—that's not a—not—not—not not a, not a, not a, not an effective, effective way in in this in this in this in this world to, uh, to the, you know to uh, to get to get the job 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 done. It, it just that 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 just just would 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 wouldn't work. Um, and you know, folks folks all at times wonder about well, gee, you know, we don't what do we, we need need a well a ladder truck 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 for everything. Everything, everything spring spring clear and that type of thing and around you know in, in our in our town we have you know sure we have we we, we have a lot of things things single and two family family homes that that type 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 of thing one of the things you use a lot of ladder truck for or for and wall platform is is the reach a lot, a lot of our homes are set back from 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 the street you need you still you still need Access to 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 a roof to ventilate that that type 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 of thing, and you, you may you don't you don't use the height, but you need to get that reach from the street to reach to reach the uh, structure. So that's a, that's a, that's one of the, the other utilities of of a lot truck in a river residential community. Okay, thank you. That that was very helpful. Uh, the other question I had was an entirely different subject, but it just um, was curious as to whether there were challenges this year to our reliance on the student firefighter force uh, because of the university being shut down so much of the year. Uh, what the effect was, how, how it played out and what the projection is for the uh, next months ahead until the university's back up and going. Well, I'll I'll start then. I'll let uh, this is Chief Strong 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 finish because the uh, students students student resources within his area of responsibility. Uh, it was it was a challenge challenge. The students the student step 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 stepped up. We have yeah. exceptional people that that become that that join 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 our students students. Student force, and they they made it work. It it was tough. It was it was difficult, but they you know we we took we took steps steps to protect them to protect to protect the the part 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 and 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 still and a lot lot of them to remain part 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 of the the, the part, part, part department. I, I like I like to say that our students student force the folks that make up our students students student force aren't your typical or stereotype. Definitely, students, 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 they're they're real, really exceptional, and they sort of stepped up. They made they uh, made made change change changes of just just adjustments and and things things of that nature to make sure that they could still be in service or in service to the town. So I've got nothing but good good things to say say to say about how 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 they went about their business this year. 
and a few, few future uh, looks 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 positive. Them. But again, I can't say enough about that and how how proud I was of what what they did this this year. So, thanks. Okay. Yeah, um, just to give you a quick synopsis, you know, I agree with the chief. Um, like everybody on the department, you know, our full time people have been here since day one of the pandemic um, on the front line, uh, just doing a phenomenal job in very stressful situations, especially during the early months when we didn't know where this was going or what was going on. Um, and our call force and student force, everybody hung in there and did what they had to do. The student force, just to give you a quick recap, a year ago in the spring, when the pandemic hit and UMass shut down, the student force did shut down for the rest of the spring, but quite a number of them, a dozen plus, uh, we transferred over to the call force because they were staying here uh, both to do schooling and wanted to continue on the fire department. So although the actual engine company didn't run last spring, a dozen of their members did serve with our call force. Um, we were frankly worried for fall 20, whether we'd be able to have enough. We need a certain minimum number to make it run but they pulled it together and they were in service with some somewhat reduced hours for the entire fall semester. And again, for this entire spring semester. So they've been here uh, doing their job and have just successfully recruited another 12 people for uh, fall this year um, because we do have four people graduating and we need to get their numbers back up. So they're slated to be back in service in September back up at full capacity. So they've really done a phenomenal job um, and an offshoot of that is we talked earlier in this meeting about temporary firefighters, uh, which was paid for by the CARES money. Um, we needed that a year ago because we had a lot of vacancies, some due to uh, retirement, some due to long-term injuries. So uh, five of them were able to step in and be uh, temporary full-time firefighters. So that was a great resource for us and helped take some of the pressure off the full-time. And now deja vu a year later, we're in the same boat as the chief said. Uh, we've got two people that have just retired from the department and two long-term injuries. So we just this week started four new different people, full-time temporary firefighters and those uh, three of those four are from our student force, one is from the call force. And I'd be remiss if I just didn't give a shout out to show you what a great group, group of people they are. Uh, the two individuals running the student force this year are both women. It's the first time we've had a woman deputy. Um, so our deputy, Alana Scardino, and her number two, her captain, uh, Anne-Marie Marquis, are graduating tomorrow. And not one, but both of them are getting the UMass Presidential Award for Achievement. That's not quite the right title. But they will actually be up on the podium tomorrow receiving those awards, which are very prestigious awards for uh, commencement. So just a really gr great group of people we attract to that force. So we're proud of them. Great. So I don't see any other hands from the committee at this point. And what I was um, would therefore like to do is go back to public comment for one last time. Uh, there's only one person who has, has a hand up um, with the, just the name Maddie. And um, what I'm going to ask is um, just off the bat after identifying uh, uh, then to let us know if it's a question that pertains to the fire department and if not we'll be able to uh, thank um, our three experts from the fire department and uh, uh, but uh, Athena I guess we could bring so hi uh, I don't know if your last name or could you introduce yourself and then let us know um, if this is directed at, um, at a question that needs to go to the fire department. Hi, uh, this is actually Matthew Sposito. I apologize for my uh, Zoom title here. I wasn't intending on speaking. I'm actually on the side of the road on a bike ride. Um, this is pertaining to the fire department. I'm also the local 1764's union president. Um, there were comments made about the overall staffing of the department and the ladder truck. Um, and I felt like it was important to ensure that the gravity of this situation is fully addressed. Chief Nelson said that with the departure of Hadley, we were up to our eyeballs with Hadley and now we're at our chin. I would absolutely disagree. We are completely underwater as far as staffing goes. 
we haven't had a notable increase in staff for about 20 years, as indicated by Assistant Chief Strongren. And I believe that Assistant Chief Olmstead highlighted the strain that it places on the providers, as well as uh, the untoward effects to the community. The increase in that 125% of fire engine responses to ensure that providers get to you and your loved one's side to provide emergency care. We are unable to routinely and consistently maintain that level at current funding and staffing levels. This absolutely needs to be addressed. We worked with the town to implement contract language to allow the town to hire four individuals back in 2018 at its discretion. No plan has been made thus far. The fire department's needs need to be addressed and it can't be neglected any longer. The community is suffering and those great people that the, all of the chiefs are commenting on are suffering along with their family. The global pandemic did not reduce the strain on the personnel that remain at the fire department. The finance committee needs to appropriate more funds to the fire department so that we can address these needs appropriately. The ladder truck is out for repairs 25% of the year and oftentimes has to be used as a transport vehicle only. The department is in disrepair and it needs to be addressed. Town Manager Bachman has not addressed them. He hasn't even shown up to the table to speak about it. I'm sorry that that's not a question, but I feel as though it is my position that that needs to be voiced. Thank you, I appreciate your comments. Athena, do you need uh, any more information for the minutes to identify the uh, speaker? No, we're good, thank you. Okay. So uh, I right. see one other hand up from the public now. Um, again, just a first name and I even, I assume it's Lenny, but maybe if I'm wrong, please correct me. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you for taking, uh, taking my call. Um, I basically was going to say a lot of the things that Maddie just spoke about earlier. Um, my name is Lynn Penza, and many of you may know my, uh, my dad used to work for the town of Amherst as a director of inspection services and building commissioner. And my dad was very active when he retired with underwriter laboratories in dealing with fire codes. And I have followed um, their Facebook page and the request. I've lived here all my life. And it's made me extremely sad to see how understaffed the fire department is and how long that they have waited for things to be fixed. When I see the photos posted of the conditions that the station is in, the center of town, or whether that's the North Station, I'm not 100% sure. It just breaks my heart that we are living in a town where taxes are so high, this has turned into basically a small city. We don't have the amount of equipment that is needed between taking care of students. You now have marijuana dispensaries coming in that are going to even put extra stress on the police and the fire department as the marijuana of the day, you know, is not like it was many, many years ago. I'm someone that'll be celebrating her 35th anniversary of sobriety in October. And I see that there's going to be a problem with that as well as in a town as prestigious as Amherst, I believe that there is no more time to waste that the staffing of the fire department must be increased immediately as fast as you can. It needs to be funded. And they definitely, for the amount of people between elderly students with three colleges have got to have 
the equipment that they need and that they deserve. So and I don't know if I formatted that properly because I've never really done this before, but you know, I know that my dad <laughs> kind of came to me and said, speak up about it if that's how you feel. And in his honor, I sort of am doing that because I know what it was like having a dad as a building commissioner who, if he saw the conditions that this station were in, I mean, I literally can't believe that this town has let it get this bad. There's no way my dad would have allowed that, you know, to go on to the point where they look like they could almost be condemned. <laughs> And maybe that isn't fair to say, but I'm only basing it on photos that I've seen. And just like we needed a new police station, we need to staff the fire department. I would love to see the one in the center of town stay there. It's an iconic historic place that many of us loved walking by. You know, when we grew up here, we are younger. Um, and you need it. It's close to like, you know, the restaurants. The changes in this town are unbelievable with the high rises going up. And I don't think that our fire department deserves to have to wait any longer to have the needs met that they deserve to protect the safety of the residents students, and even visitors who come to this town. So basically, I wanted to say I'm fully in support of please getting them the equipment they need. If I hit the mega millions on Friday, I'd be happy to do it. <laughs> but I don't know if my chances better be good. Um, but, you know, I hope you understand where I'm coming from, that I am that concerned. I know that any time if I've had to go to the hospital, they've been super wonderful to me. And just to see this, I'm, I'm basically in shock. I also lived in New York City, you know, one of the best fire departments around. Amherst deserves not to have to rely on other towns to help them. So I really hope that they take this seriously. And, you know, very nice to meet you all. Thank you for listening. And if there's anything I could do, I'd be happy to try to help as much as I possibly can. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And again, you know, I hope you, you got to have what you need for the minutes. Well, uh, Lenny, I'm afraid we didn't catch your last name. Would you like to give your last name? And if yeah, my last name is Penza. My dad is Chet Penza, Building Commissioner, Director of Inspection Services for the Town of Amherst. Terrific. And you're an Amherst resident? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I grew up on Grace Street, right near the high school. And, you know, with everything going on in the world, we all know it's been a very difficult year with COVID. Um, things have changed so much. I, I don't think you can face what's going to happen when the students come back in the fall. You know, you know, they've been away from each other. They're going to want to party. It's going to put extra stress. The staffing has got to be there. You know, I don't want to have to wait to see a tragedy happen before something is finally done and the equipment that they need and the staffing that they need is not available. So, you know, with our taxes going up, I can't understand why this is not at the top of the list and not to take away from funding for a new library but ask yourselves, what's more important, public safety or getting a new library? You really need to put priorities at the top. And public safety, getting your loved ones to hospital, accidents. If you don't have the staff, who's gonna help? You can't always rely on student, you know, students that are learning volunteers it really to me as I've seen the changes you know from a little girl to where we are now it, it does 
break my heart to see the conditions that the station is in. And I know if my dad was still here, that wouldn't be the case. So I'm hoping and praying that you take, you know, all the lovely comments that were made by everyone and really they've waited 10, 11, how many years, 20 years? We've got to have new fire trucks and you definitely, I agree. They've got to have at least four ambulances and possibly five. And we have to find a way to fund it. Okay, well, Lenny, thank you very much. I well, thank you. I appreciate I, all of you. I appreciate your comments and uh, your perspective is very helpful. Um, so appreciate uh, comments from the public. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Chief Nelson, Assistant Chief uh, uh, Strongroom and Olmstead for staying with us. We appreciate the um, information you provided and the perspective you provided and um, will be subject of uh, further discussion in the committee as we work towards our um, recommendation. Of course, we are bound in what we can do in this round of the budget year. Uh, by what the charter and state law provides that is the process for budgets and communities that are in the city category, but uh, it is helpful for the finance committee and those of us who are counselors to hear from you. And so thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. Thanks, thanks for the in, 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 in I really appreciate your time and, you know, don't let, let this be the, the only four four forum where 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 you re, re, reach out out to us. Feel feel free and 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 any day any time to re, to reach out to one two or all all three 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 of us for anything you feel you need to know. Thank you. Well, thank right. you. Take care. Thank you very much. We'll see. You. So just have a couple of minutes left. I think I don't know if Sean has other things that he wants to talk about. Um, I wanted to just get a little bit on uh, the process uh, and alert you to what I've been working on and we'll send out for comments to any of you who have time to look at it. Um, I hope tonight to have pretty much of a, um, a, a lock on what's getting close to the end on the uh, report that I have to give to the council for the meeting next week. Um, and uh, I have uh, done some modifications this morning after getting some comments back uh, from Sean and uh, Lynn. And so I uh, and will get it to you if you have any uh, thoughts. I wanted to make sure that I had the president of the council uh, and her perspective. The uh, sections that I have written is um, a fairly uh, a complete description of the water and sewer rate discussion that we had, um, a somewhat of a discussion on where we are with the um, auditor selection process and particularly focusing on the issue that we dealt with last time, which was the uh, committee and then um, uh, the last section, what I, I started to work on pieces of the budget. And what I was doing is, as I had said, is that when I have the um, submissions or the capability to do it on my own, uh, doing uh, which is really the sections that I was assigned to, to do um, sort of brief, um sections on each uh, segment that we could then incorporate in the report so that the council doesn't have to read all of it at one time but can read it as uh, we go along and it also helps us to get our writing done uh, when it's fresher in our minds so when you see it it might prompt you to the kind of uh, uh, 
things that you might think about. I don't think we need to necessarily be long. It depends upon the nature of the information that we've been provided. Um, and the last thing that I just had is a uh, question for you. And then I see if there's anything else that any members of the committee have the topics that they hadn't, um, you know, that have come up in the last 48 hours and see if Sean has any or has anything final or Sonia. Uh, last time we were scheduled to do veterans and um, we did a very brief discussion of veteran services, uh, but Steve Connor, who's the uh, one who provides veteran services and oversees veteran services for us and other communities, uh, was not able to join us in the end. And uh, so uh, I guess it's whether anybody feels that we need to ask him to come back. Otherwise, I'm just going to write up based upon our discussion of last week, try and get that included in what I send to you tonight. So nobody is seeming to indicate that they feel that we need to, to bring him, ask him to come to a meeting. Sean, is there anything else we need to do? Or Sonia? Um, not today. I just recap. I'm going to send out the questions, as many of them as I have, and I'll try to incorporate some of those we heard um, and get that out to the group um, tomorrow. Um, I'll send it out to this full group, and then we can post it in the packet so that it's uh, there going forward. Okay. So, okay, I, uh, Kathy? Just, I, I sent Sean a note, but I noticed when I went to look at for library today, I had it in an attached file, but it wasn't in the posted, but it posted packet. So if we could just, there are only going to be a few of those. It was library and elementary school and the elementary school, the larger budget wasn't there, just the presentation was. So if we could get the library presentation posted also, Sean and Athena. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I'll work with Athena to get those both posted. Um, it's just some of those have more information than we had before we went to the meeting. So it's it's useful um, to be able to reference them. Yep, absolutely. Okay, anything else from any members of the committee? If not, then uh, I think we'll declare ourselves adjourned. It's been a long afternoon for counselors and for the rest of you who are waiting for us to get off of the council meeting that we were on. So thank you very much. Thank and you, uh, thank you. we're adjourned at uh, whatever time it is, 457.